and welcome to another episode of The Grind Bin. I'm Mike Wood. I'm Chris Mann. Today we're going to be talking about 1982's 1990 The Bronx Warriors. They should have blown that fucking bridge. Hey Bobby, I got the money! Yeah, I made the team! You're a hooker! Get that goddamn thing out of your mouth, bro. Get it out of your mouth. This book ain't got, 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 no, got, no, got, no, got no field coach. Hello, get the man. You could have looked decent once in a while. And maybe daddy wouldn't have had to kill himself because he couldn't get it up anymore. What a shame. Come on, just step on the gas before we get creepy. And more. So, Chris, today's movie is a listener review request mm. from our good friend at Bobby Batson on Twitter. Oh, cool. Um, he's also on Facebook, uh, but I have at Bobby Batson at Twitter. Um, he, you can find him. as He goes by Robert on Facebook. He comments on our posts on there. He left us a voicemail to oh. tell us why. Oh, and by the way, Bobby Batson is responsible for that review I read at the end of the van episode where I said it's the highest praise we've ever received, <laughs> uh, which was that review equating listening to the show to be at the end of the Blind Melon video where yeah. they find the other B people, which yeah. I still think is the highest praise I've ever received. Beautiful, eloquence, visual. I admire him. So he sent us a message saying, like, uh, here's my choice. Mm. So... Let's see what he has to say in the voicemail he left us, Chris. Hey, guys. This is Bobby from Long Beach, California. And this week, I was thinking we'd explore my favorite subgenre of grindhouse cinema, the post-apocalyptic Italian knockoff action movie. So I was thinking we'd get on our bikes and ride with the Bronx Warriors. Now, this one's special to me because it feels like a film that I would have made if I'd had the means when I was six. From boot to bonnet, this whole thing is just an insane battle royale of discount action figures. And, you know, for all of its shortcomings and eccentricities, it still left this impact on pop culture that we felt, even if we didn't know it back then. Because if you grew up playing Double Dragon or Streets of Rage, things like that, you definitely know that girl with the whip, amongst other characters, too. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed as much as I do. I love the show. And seeing as I am a ginger named Bobby, <laughs> I'll go start the van. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I told you I had a surprise, Chris. That is, I, uh, I love him. Love it. Bobby, have, is your last name Hampton? Oh, like Chris is wondering, so. Yeah. Any relation? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a friend named DeVito or Andy? <laughs> so, Chris, Bobby also sent me some trivia for this movie. Oh, cool. Uh, here you go. Really interesting stuff, by the way, because this movie has a rich tapestry, and he's right about one thing. We are finally getting into a subgenre of movie that we have not covered mm. in almost 50 episodes yet. Really? The Italian post-apocalyptic action Aha, adventure, yeah. which there are numerous of. Mm. Uh, you know, you see a Mad Max, Road Warrior, stuff like that. We all want to make our knockoff version of it, <laughs> Escape from New York. All these movies, you know, you got to roll them into, uh, they're popular, so you want to make your version of it. I want to make a post-apocalyptic version of the van. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. Maybe they'll fit into this movie, Chris. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the stuff Bobby has sent me, lead actor Mark Gregory. Chris, yeah. uh, who was, by the way, 17 when this movie was filmed. <laughs> he was 17 years old in this movie. Yeah. What uh, a physique. <laughs> well, he was found by the director one night while cruising, which if you've ever seen the uh, Al Pacino movie Cruising, you mm -hmm. can figure out what that means. It's also said that he found him in a gym, uh, the director. Mm -hmm. The gym bathroom or like the, the, the basketball court? I don't court know. <laughs> <laughs> but these are the facts online. Uh, he couldn't speak a lick of English. And that's why he had to recite all his lines phonetically for each take. And that's why the ADR does not match okay. up whatsoever. Thank you. Everybody's ADR'd in this yeah. movie, Chris. Yes. Every single person, even Vic Morrow, is mm. ADR'd. Nobody even mm. uses their real goddamn voice. I had a feeling. Except that is Fred Williamson's voice. I don't know if he ADR'd himself because I don't think there were microphones on the set. He also needed to be... Okay, so apparently Mark Gregory also needed to be taught by his castmates to, quote, act less gay because... <laughs> Right. Uh, his mannerisms are, are not of a typical biker, I'd say. Not in the least. Just everything from his stands to just... But I would I say know. most people don't fit the uh, gang mentality of this movie. Uh, no. 
it's it's a very interesting choice. Now, when Bobby says we're we're talking about double dragon figures, uh, we are. We're t- we're talking about liter- like literally a video game on screen. Yeah. Uh, and each gang has their interesting quirks, and uh, <laughs> I can't wait to get into uh, how this movie relates to one movie we watched a long time ago, Thrashing. And I yes. feel like uh, the daggers could fit right into this. Oh, world definitely. We're enter. Yeah. Uh, maybe they'd rename themselves the writers at one point. Who knows? So the other thing is that Bobby confirmed all that information with Fred Williamson mm. in person last year. No, really? <laughs> yeah, so he got it from oh. uh, from Fred's mouth himself. Good for him. Uh, also, he writes, one of the cast members completely eats it on a motorcycle, which I'm sure you noticed. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. That was real. And I, just left it, it had in. to have been. It's too real. Yeah. And man, he just hit it like he just hit something real wrong and then ate shit hard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, like you could have it's you, bad. No stunt guy could have choreographed a shit eating <laughs> session like that. No, it's like a legit bad fall. And it yeah. looks like he was seriously. He was injured. going really fast. There was no way to you know there was it was like a bump or something or like a real rough turn or I don't know. It looked like he just went on the sidewalk and just went yeah. like had a seizure and flew off the bike. Yeah. Now, according to an article in Coming Attractions magazine, Chris, the movie was conceived when Fabrizio De Angelis missed a subway train stop for his Manhattan hotel and ended up in the South Bronx, which, oh my God. (laughs) Similar to the plot of the novel and the film, The Bonfire of the Vanities, uh, which at the time was notoriously dangerous area. Uh, To say the South Bronx was dangerous in the 80s is not an understatement. No. Infested by street gangs, drug addicts, and just about every type of criminal there was, entire blocks of the neighborhood had been reduced to rubble by fires, both accidental and deliberately set. Uh, D'Angelis walked through the area and was both enthralled and repelled by the devastation he saw at the assortment of derelicts, criminals, and obvious mental cases. Soon he was confronted by thugs with switchblades and quickly made his escape. He got back to his hotel in one piece, and the experience inspired this film. Uh, the other... Hmm. <laughs> no, it sounds like no, no. It just sounds like stuff I've been counting on tour before, like yeah, years ago. Well, yeah. Chris, you gotta get back and pull out that pen, buddy. What are you doing? Yeah, I know. Well, some stuff you don't want to remember. Okay, they're just <laughs> you, you just want to you know. It's there's a, there's definitely some post traumatic stress with stuff like that, yeah. and you don't really want yeah, you want gotta to use it, them. Chris. We could you gotta be, use it. We huh? could be making Bronx Warriors. You know <laughs> the fuck. <laughs> yeah. So, Chris. As you might know, mm. Vic Morrow met uh, an unfortunate end, which we will get into a little bit later mm. uh, when we go into his background. This was his last completed film before his death. Mm. And we will get into his death uh, very soon. During the meeting scene between the Riders and the Tigers overlooking the World Trade Center, you might have noticed there was drummers in that scene. Well, this was not apparently originally scripted. The band was present in the area during the day of shooting, so the director just decided to include them in the scene, giving no explanation as to why they were there. But boy, did it set the scene great. It's one of the best moments in the movie. Yeah, because I feel like it's building up to maybe an execution or a funeral. But it really builds up to nothing. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, which is, I can pretty much describe this movie. All of Fred's Williamson, all of Fred Williamson's scenes were shot in Rome, Italy. Not one in New York. No shit. Was, uh, yeah, they, they they did most of this stuff in sets in Rome. Hmm. Half of the picture was shot in Italy due to Italian monetary regulations, so Italian sound stages were used for the interiors of this movie, hmm. not the Bronx. The film was shot in 1981, but not released until the end of 1982. Permission was not granted to close down the streets of the Bronx while filming, hence the fact that traffic can be seen proceeding in a perfectly orderly yeah. fashion yeah. as the riders cruise down the road <laughs> in the supposedly lawless no man's land. And also, I'd let you know before we get into the cast and crew that there is a sequel to this movie. It is called Bronx Warriors 2, Escape from the Bronx, Hmm. and it still has uh, Mark Gregory in it. Oh, cool. Which, by the way, we're going to get into the story of Mark Gregory is very fascinating because this this is a this is a, a deep dark tunnel. There's a there's a lot of stories in this movie that that are very full of twists and turns. Chris. I can there's only a lot imagine of mystery and intrigue about this movie. <laughs> I can only imagine <laughs> the set pieces and <laughs> costumes I'm seeing. There's got to be some weird story behind these. So the director Chris Enzo G Castellari. Mm-hmm. 
uh, director and one of the writers for this movie. He's an Italian director who made over 40 movies and is actually still directing. He has a project in the works now titled Kioma Rises, which stars Franco Nero, who's hmm. a prolific actor with over 200 credits, known to many exploitation fans as Django and the original Django yep. and another one. Uh, he's in tons more movies like Enter the Ninja from the canon films. Uh, Franco Nero is in tons and tons and tons of great exploitation movies, so he's uh, still teaming with this director and making a movie movie this year. So I thought that was fascinating. That's amazing, yeah. uh, the, he, Enzo is the son of Marino Girolami, who's a prolific exploitation director from Italy who directed over 70 movies. Mm. Was He was offered... Now, his son Enzo, who directed this movie, was offered the opportunity to direct Zombie in 1979. Oh, wow. Yeah. But was not keen on directing a horror film and asked for a budget which the producers considered unrealistic. They then gave Lucio Fulci yeah. the opportunity to direct it. After the film's success, the same producers pro- approached Enzo again to direct another gory horror movie, The Last Shark, in 1981, which he did accept. 1966 was his first credit for a movie, but he went uncredited for directing the movie A Few Dollars for Django, which didn't have Franco Nero in hmm. it as Django, uh, but he did direct a ton of films with Franco Nero, including, hmm. uh, well, I didn't write him any of them down, but uh, there's a ton of Franco Nero movies that he's made. The only other movie I have written down that Enzo directed, even though he has over 40, is 1978's Inglorious Bastards, which is a great movie. Uh, it's, lo- you know, the new one is loosely, very loosely based yeah. on it. But there's a great cameo in there. In uh, the new one? Yeah. Oh. Oh, Oh, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I said Inglorious Bastards. Oh, the sorry, no, but Django. Franco Nero is in the in new Django. Django. Yeah. Yeah, he's in that part with the uh, the fight. Yeah. And the, with at that like hotel or something, and he first meets Leonardo DiCaprio before they yeah. go to Candyland. Uh, Franco Nero comes up to Django, Jamie Foxx at the bar, and says, like, I know how to pronounce it. Like, D's silent. Or J's silent. <laughs> yeah. It's great. D's silent. No, he directed 1978's Inglorious Bastards, which uh, if you've ever seen, obviously everybody's seen the Quentin Tarantino Inglorious Bastards. Mm. It's loosely based on the 1978 movie directed by this man. I say loosely because it's kind of, it's it's not, it's in name and the idea, mm. but in the original Inglorious Bastards is about guys, Americans, going in to infiltrate the Nazis by pretending to be Nazis. But what's really funny in that movie is that they have Fred Williamson with them, who's a black <laughs> man. Yeah. And they wonder, like, well, how the hell are we going to pretend he's a Nazi? <laughs> 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 so it's a, it's a good movie. Yeah, we might cover that one day. I really like that one though. I don't I don't know if there's anything to say about it because it's kind of an enjoyable movie for me. Yeah, yeah. So he directed many more movies. Now three credited writers on this movie. One being Enzo. The other. Let's we'll start with Elisa Brigatani. Fifteen credits. Lots of Italian exploitation movies, including Chris. 1979 Zombie, which is Zombie Two. Yeah. Directed by Lucio Fulci. Went on to write a lot of his movies, actually. So the lady who co-wrote this movie wrote a lot of Fulci movies. 1981 The House by the Cemetery. 1982 Manhattan Baby. And 1984 New Gladiators. She also wrote 1986 Aladdin, starring Bud. Spent starring Bud Spencer, who just recently passed away last year. The other writer, D- Dardano Sacchetti. He was a prolific horror and exploitation writer, Chris. Mm-hmm. 1980, Cannibal Holocaust. I'm sorry, 1980, Cannibal Apocalypse. 1980, City of the Living Dead. 1981, The Beyond. 1982 was the co-writer with Elisa on Manhattan Baby. 1982, he is uncredited, but he wrote Amneville 2, The Possession. 1985, oh, one of my favorite <laughs> Italian... Now, I love this Italian cannibal movie. Mm-hmm. I don't like the cannibal movies very much at all. Like, I'm not a fan of Cannibal No, Holocaust not at all. I, for or his, Cannibal For the Ferro. same reasons, I mean, you can, yeah. I can do without those, right? Yeah. But he wrote one that I really do love that's absolutely insane and crazy and very weird. 1985's Massacre in Dinosaur Valley. He's uncredited for writing that movie, but it, it's a fun one. It's worth watching. Okay. And we, we're probably going to cover it at some point in this show. Mm. He also wrote, Chris, one of your favorites. 1985, he wrote the movie Demons. Mm. And then 1986, he wrote Demons 2. All right. He is still writing movies as recently as 2013, so he's still out there, still making those horror movies. So we get in the cra- uh, we get in the cast now, Chris. Here we go. Mark Gregory, who plays Trash. Wonderful name. Basically his first movie. The only thing he did before was like a brief TV appearance. Now, you've already heard he was 17 and how the director found him. 
<laughs> well, now, yeah. he only has 11 credits, Chris. 1983, after this, he did a movie called Adam and Eve, which I'm assuming he played Adam. Mm. 1983, Escape from the Bronx, sequel to this movie. 1989 was his last movie, Afghanistan, the last war bus. <laughs> and then he simply disappeared from the face of the earth. As in vanished? As I mean in... this literally. Nobody can find him, huh. and nobody knows what happened to him. However, there is a website you might want to check out, which is called The Hunt for Trash. <laughs> BronxWarriors.co.uk. A guy by the name of Lance Manley has searched for the actor. <laughs> he has searched for Mark Gregory for over 10 years. Go check out his website, and you can see the full search, including in 2012 when he thinks he found him, but he might have not. <laughs> It very, I mean, there's a lot of mystery surrounding this guy. He just simply disappeared. Huh. Like, didn't want to be, didn't want to talk to anybody, didn't want to be involved in anything, just gone. I, I could say it's, the reclusive life might be preferable after movies like these. I, I feel like Chris is going to do this one day. Like, all of a yeah. sudden, I'll never hear from him again. The he'll old, just, I, yeah. He'll just pull the old. Uh, Irish exit. <laughs> But I feel like you, you'll you'll fake your death. You'll throw a dummy over an overpass. Everybody will know it's a dummy because it's filled with, just filled with cotton. And, and uh, candy and desserts. <laughs> like, well, that's what he loves. So naturally, it's him. So yeah. we get to our next person in this movie, Fred Williamson, who plays the ogre. That's his only name credited in this. He, Fred Williamson needs no introduction to exploitation movie fans. He nope. only has over 120 credits. Yeah. And he's like in every goddamn exploitation movie and black exploitation movie in the 1970s and 80s. He's amazing. Fred Williamson <laughs> kicks ass. He is a grime bit all star, even though I believe this is the first movie we've covered with him in it. Mm -hmm. But boy, we will get to more. So now we go to the girl in the movie, Anne, who I was surprised had a name. I didn't realize this until the very end of the movie. Stephanie Girolami. Well, she's the daughter of the director. Oh, really? And the reason for that, we will find out, is apparently she is quoted as saying she once said of working on this movie, quote, it was one of those things my dad was casting and didn't find the girl he wanted. <laughs> So I tried and it worked. I think it's also because he trusts me a lot. Always has. And it's a wonderful feeling for a daughter. That movie also gave me the opportunity to practice my behind-the-camera abilities as an AD on my days off. Hmm. And I loved it. Well, she only has nine credits acting, mostly in her dad's movies, but she still works as an AD on lots of TV shows and movies. Oh, good for her. Uh, I'll just give you a few. 1993, she was an AD on Mario Brothers. 1995, Empire Records. And 1989, the show Dawson's Creek, she's still working and still oh. does a lot of AD stuff. Now we get to the last credit. Now here we go, everybody. Turn down the lights. This one's a downer. Vic Morrow, who plays Hammer. Yeah. Now you know Vic Morrow? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know Vic Morrow? The story of Vic Morrow? Well, apparently I'm about to learn. Oh, Chris. I'm very surprised you don't know who this man is. Mm. He was a prolific actor in tons of movies and TV shows. He was very well known for his role as Sergeant Saunders in the TV show Combat, mm -hmm. which was on like 195 episodes of that show. He was also in 1976 Bad News Bears. He played Roy Turner. But Chris, this was his last movie released before his death on the set of the Twilight Zone movie... Okay. Vic this, Morrow yeah. is the man who had a helicopter land yeah. on him and yeah. two Vietnamese children in the first segment of that movie. Mm -hmm. And attorney James Neal defended John Landis, who along with George Fosley Jr., Dan Allingham, Paul Stewart, Dorsey Wingo, were all charged with involuntary manslaughter. And they were all found not guilty, by the way, yeah. of the death of Vic Morrow and those two Vietnamese children that right. were uh, decapitated. decapitated by yeah. a helicopter. Yeah, and apparently that footage actually exists of that happening. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a horrible thing yeah. and uh, it's uh, obviously i can't even believe they finished that movie that was the first segment filmed and then they decided to carry on with the movie yeah despite I, that happening oh my god i would just like you know what we're pulling the plug this is there's no way to carry on with that mark on that film to go ahead and market that it's like hey come I and know. see well, this yeah, it's, apparently it's a lot horrible. of people there's a lot of mixed emotions about that one that, yeah. that court case lasted for 10 years Oh, uh, and I, you know, I, it's a terrible thing. Yeah. Obviously, I mean, you know, this movie, the danger was real. <laughs> a lot of it, but my God. Yeah. I mean, I guess the only good thing that came out of that Twilight Zone death was that uh, movie onset deaths went down mm -hmm. in the next year, but they still have not stopped. There's plenty of people no. that still die on movie sets. Well, yeah, it, it's sad that precedent has to be set in order for new regulations and safety uh, measures to be taken. And even then, I agree. even then, 
a lot of them are circumvented by you know people trying to cut corners and yeah, it's, it's it's disgusting. It's just very odd that this is the last movie finished and released by him yeah. before Twilight Zone because yeah. what an odd movie to go out on. Yeah. I mean, I guess you can count Twilight Zone. He basically died making the well, he did die making the movie, but yeah. this movie, what a bizarre choice. Although I gotta say, Vic Morrow is really, I mean, even though it's not his voice, he's giving it his all in this movie. He's yeah. doing his best Charles Bronson impression, <laughs> that's for damn sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, Chris, we get into the movie. We have this great credit sequence with this great music. <sighs> the credits really set the tone for this movie. You got the like the black background and these like stark half shots of like half of somebody like holding a weapon yeah. and like the spikes and the face paint. Almost feels like a makeup commercial. <laughs> Like a L'Oreal commercial. Yeah, I did. Uh, we see close-ups of the weapons, roller skates, painted faces, all sorts of great stuff. And then we cut to this lady. She's just running across the bridge, right? So she's going from mm-hmm. Manhattan to the Bronx, okay? And then we just cut to some guys in an office, and we find out that apparently this girl's important, and she's gone missing, and she has important information, okay? And they want to contact a man named The Hammer to get her back. And yeah. this one guy says, it's a bis- it's, he's a bit risky, and the other guy responds, well, we have no choice. So when, when things are bad, Chris, who are you going to call? Oh, the hammer. So then we get text on screen, which is always wonderful. It says, 1990, the Bronx is officially declared, quote, no man's land. The authorities give up all attempts to restore law and order. From then on, the area is ruled by the writers. But it's not really ruled by the writers. It's ruled by Fred Williamson and his tiger gang. Yeah. Because he declares himself the king (laughs) and actually has a literal throne that he sits on and calls everybody his subjects. I love that. And you said in the beginning of this, Chris, you said, blow that bridge. Yeah. If the Bronx is a no man's land, why even have a connection to Manhattan? Just Thank fucking you. get rid of it. That's Just what I'm be saying. Like, you know what? We're done. Yeah. Cut it off. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> and we'll find out in this movie, by the way, that if you just put like maybe a piece of wood in the road, it will stop them. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah. Nobody knows how to turn a, a, a direction. Okay. Yeah. If they turn a direction, they're going to fall. <laughs> That's we yeah. out. Then we see, okay, so the same woman from that bridge, right? Now yep. she's running down a tunnel, and mm. oh my God, here's where it starts. She runs by these guys wearing roller skates, and I guess they're hockey uniforms. Yeah, it's almost like something <laughs> out of like some Logan's Run costume reject department. Okay, this is where this movie, I mean, okay. So we got to say, like, I guess Road Warrior is what started this shit, right? Yeah. The idea that in an apocalypse, people would spend more time on their looks than their homes. Mm-hmm. I, I guess. The, yeah. Like, it always amazes me that in every one of these post-apocalyptic movies, everybody has so much time to put on face makeup and also to have matching outfits <laughs> and nice cor- like nice hair, you know? Everybody's got, like, the, the looks are so important in the <laughs> apocalypse, and I don't understand it. It's uniformity. You got to stand in or fall out. You know, you fall in or fall out, Mike. The, okay. Now, we did mention that the main character of this movie in real life was a homosexual. He was a gay man. Yeah. Okay. But it seems to me kind of like in Thrashing, I'll put this as delicately as I can, that the Bronx is now run by a bunch of gay gangs. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> because everybody spends so much time on the choreography, <laughs> the dance moves, mm. <laughs> the makeup. The makeup especially. <laughs> I mean, it's very uh it's very Broadway. <laughs> Like, I guess they're in New York, you know, and translated over. Well, yeah, there's a part where I'm like, is this Clockwork Orange on ice? Yeah, everybody's trying to put on a show, okay? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's amazing the amount yeah. of detail. Not a speck of dirt on anybody, no. right? Impeccable makeup. <laughs> <laughs> Uniforms. Okay, so by the way, these these roller skating guys, which we'll find out, they're not named the roller skate gang. They're named the zombies. Yeah. What that relation is, I'm not sure. Okay. But they wear like some sort of like white vests, like white poofy vests, white helmets, and they all have field hockey, like yeah. white field hockey sticks. These vests, they form like a weird triangle. Yeah. Like a. You know. I, I, there's no way to explain it other than, like, it looks like something out of American Gladiators or something. Uh, yeah. Like, if you're running down that thing where they shoot you with the tennis balls, you know? Yeah. It looks like what you wear for that. Oh, they're shooting balls at you, all yeah. right. <laughs> so they confront the woman, right? Yeah. And they just kind of skate around her. And then all of a sudden. <laughs> skate around her. They do. They just kind of skate yeah. around her. And they're, like, they're putting their sticks in the air and doing some sort of dance choreography. Do you think move. at the end of it, like, 
We didn't do it like we practiced. <laughs> oh, I think they have a lot of problems with the. Uh, you were wrong. You were out of step. Yeah. You're out of the gag. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of tears. I think when she showed up, they were just like, finally, somebody we can show our act to. Can you wait? Hold on. Get her there. Let's show her. Yeah. And they skate around and she's like, oh my God. She's like, no, no, no. Don't be scared. This is, we waited a long time for somebody to show up. Yeah. The writers won't watch it. Yeah. Nobody will watch us. Please, Please don't run. Can you take notes? <laughs> <laughs> So, we have no mirrors to watch this. There's a rehearsal hall. Yeah, and I don't see one mirror in this this Bronx. No. You're right, Chris. Uh, because they get their makeup. So How the good. hell do they get their makeup on with no mirrors? Because in this they world? do it for each other. <laughs> so how do they set the precedent? Like they're like, okay, so everybody's face makeup by twelve o'clock. So did they wake up? Obviously, the makeup's gonna smear. Okay, yeah, people get sweaty. Right. So is this a daily routine where everybody's got it? By the way, everyone's very clean. Yeah. I haven't seen one shower or what running water. There in are this no area. smudges. So you're telling me every day they wake up at about six a.m. and they're yeah. like, okay, well we gotta get it looking good by mm. nine a.m. because yeah. the other gangs are gonna be out. We gotta look cool too in yeah. case somebody comes running over that bridge. Yeah, it's all about appearances around here okay yeah. <laughs> and we want to be first we got to outfab the other band <laughs> the other gang these writers guys show up okay yeah. the quote writers which is uh basically let's just take the daggers from thrashing and instead of riding skateboards they're now riding motorcycles but they look exactly the same oh yeah from like the, the, the black leather <laughs> the denim almost like a rob halford kind of thing very rob halford yeah in fact trash the main guy yeah uh who's only 17 apparently he couldn't find a vest that would cover his whole chest because it's ripped all the way down to like the navel and right. like He's every scene of him. He's got to find some way to show a little bit of nipple. Like, <laughs> there's not one shot of this man without nip showing. <laughs> like he's a wardrobe malfunction just walking around. Yeah. This guy. <laughs> Do you think he made it? Like made it went to whip around so fast that the that the flap of the vest just kind of. I, no, it's like always like perfectly placed, by the way. Yeah. Like they spend a lot of time making sure that that little nip's going to be out. Mm-hmm. Also, he has wonderfully curled hair, which oh I'm, my sure, God. It <laughs> I'm is... sure takes a lot of time to get ready in yeah. the morning. These guys are just wait, And all his gang members, so like there's a lot of bizarre Nazi paraphernalia coming oh from my an God. Italian. I is couldn't bizarre. believe that. I could not believe that. Like, where is this coming from? <laughs> like the third, like the fourth Reich is now happening in yeah. the Bronx. <laughs> There's like there's parts where like black guys have swatches yeah, I painted on that. their bikes. I'm like And their helmets uh, too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's an odd choice. He's like, no, man, it's, it, it, it's different if you take control of it. You got to give it a new... <laughs> yeah, it's ours now. <laughs> yeah, we reclaimed it. They show up, and Chris, oh, my God, not only are they all in matching motorcycles, which, yeah. by the way, how did they get them? That's another thing okay, Yeah, where about. do they rip these off from? Do they build them? No. But what I'm wondering is, how do they all get the same glowing skulls? Like... <laughs> The Halloween store. They so raided. All of them have like a Halloween decoration glowing skull mm. on the front of their bike that has a light in it. Yeah. So they've all fastened this glowing skull to their bike somehow, and they ride around town with their little skull bikes, all matching, very clean, by the way, impeccably clean. Everybody's impeccably dressed. It is the cleanest part of the bike. It is. It stands out. It's like a Disneyland ride, almost. You know, if they had a microphone on set, by the way, it would be a real challenge because there's so much fucking leather in this movie. <laughs> You would just hear constant, like, yeah. <laughs> maybe that's why they tried to record the audio, like, well, this is yeah. not going to work. Yeah. You, you send it back to me, all I hear is leather rubbing against itself. And exhaust and movie. mufflers and motorcycles. <laughs> Can you imagine a producer getting this footage back and being like, oh, <laughs> oh, I didn't think we were making like a West Side Story type deal. <laughs> <laughs> when you told me there was a <laughs> was a gang called the Sharks and all that stuff, I thought you were just. <laughs> I did not know it was gonna be this. <laughs> I'm I, not sure how I'm gonna market this one. I mean, will it win a Tony? Maybe. I mean, I gotta tell you, when we get to that scene with the mimes, I'm very. <laughs> I gotta ask you, do we need it? Because <laughs> this one's a challenge. <laughs> Okay, so it's like you wonder, by the way, who is this movie for? Other right? than like a 10 year old. I mean, who I is this know. movie for? Because I, I, I had so much trouble getting into this. I'm like, is this for me? Because I. No, it's clearly not. I couldn't get into it. I mean, I, like, okay, so you go to the movie theater expecting yeah. to see like a violent, post apocalyptic, exploitation movie, and you get that. 
dark but then and gritty. you also get a bunch of makeup choreographed dances yeah i mean there's a literal part where people dance with canes and fight yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is like it's a sick. mix between what we just said and a 1960s <laughs> batman episode yeah. like it's very it's very <laughs> bizarre i could see the joker from that show showing up mm-hmm. you know what i mean it would yeah. make oh, perfect definitely. sense or the riddler you know with yeah. the tights and everything he would he would fit in in this bronx yeah. oh I, yeah like a, a robin with the thigh high schwartz <laughs> and swinging around so then, okay, so they, we've gotten so far. This, so basically, these guys show up, right? Yeah. And there's these two gangs, and they have a nicely choreographed fight. Like, they've practiced it before. It's mm. almost as if they're like, finally, we can show somebody somebody our stunt show, right? Oh, God. Somebody they the showed same... up. <laughs> but they fail because they realize that they've been studying them, and they have the exact same moves as each other. And well, I'm just... saying, they must have practiced. Yeah. Like, I think that they have practice sessions. They're like, yeah. well, if anybody shows up, can we please do the fight routine? Yeah. And, like, somebody gave them the signal. Like a light went up in the sky. They're like, "Oh, oh, it's time! Somebody's yeah. here! Somebody came race. across the bridge!" <laughs> yeah. They come over and they're like, "Okay, you remember our moves?" Ha, yeah, ha, ha. yeah. And they're like, "Music's playing. They're all dancing. I mean, like, they're fighting like it's Errol Flynn in in Robin Hood. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Like he's, he's prancing around, and they're all like, they got their moves <laughs> and these weird hockey sticks that aren't really hockey sticks, but like, uh, oh, what the hell would you call these things? They're supposed to be like they're metal field and, hockey sticks. Yeah, but they're like metal now. Like and... they got the wrong hockey stick. Yeah. They're like <laughs> this is they like went what... to the store and he's like uh, yes do you have any ho- uh, a hockey stick he goes oh, all i got is field hockey buddy yeah oh it's fine no it's not the same sport <laughs> yeah. it's that's not at all it's a completely different shape stick yeah it's all stubby mm-hmm. so it's like, yeah you're right it's it's the, it's the wrong stick not at all you're not supposed to wear rollerblades with that one or roller skates yeah they're just yeah no in line on this one so the writers they win this fight they win the choreographed fight yeah it's all staged it's okay right, right. nobody nobody's hurt yeah. oh actually they are there is that part where all right so switchblades they never refer back to this but i love this is like there's a part where trash is fighting these guys mm. and then he presses some sort of button and switchblades come out of his tire yeah on the front of the bike oh my god yeah best scene ever and then he he runs through two guys and slices a dude in the face yeah and his, it shows like his his lips completely. Yeah, his, his like part of his face is like like severed. Yeah, and it the okay the I'll give this movie this the body gore effects are awesome. Oh yeah, so yeah, good. Yeah, like an Italian film. They yeah, spend so a good. lot of money on the gore. Yeah, which and, is and, so and, odd to to mix in with what we're gonna see in the rest of this. Movie. Unfortunately, the editing and pacing is a lot like an Italian horror film. Very much so. Yeah. So the writers end up winning, right? And then Trash, he goes over to this girl, and he's basically like, oh, well, you came across the bridge. The show's over for the day. Yeah. That Let was me the... take you back to Manhattan. Yeah, Thanks the... for coming. Yeah. We won't charge you this time. This yeah. was just a practice. But M- tell your friends. Matinee, we can't do two shows in one day for <laughs> obvious reasons. This is why. Next time, bring over some more people. We, we've been practicing <laughs> real hard. As you can see, it's yeah. a work in progress. Yeah. I didn't mean to actually slice that guy's face in half, but, yeah. you know, accidents happen. This was basically press night. <laughs> <laughs> for the gangs. <laughs> Do you write for the paper? We were waiting for a New York Times reporter. <laughs> so he basically takes her with him because she's like, no, I don't want to go. Yeah. I, I ran to the Bronx. And he's like, okay, well, you're my girlfriend now. Well, that's what he does. Yeah, basically. Because this is a video game, yeah. you know? It's like, oh, great. I saved the girl. She's mine now. Yeah. We don't have anything in common, but yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll make it work. She has no real dialogue Wait. or anything that matters, but... <laughs> We've been dealing with a lot of movies where relationships are built on convenience, and this is not an <laughs> exception. Okay, that's when we get the amazing scene. Next scene is this amazing scene of a man playing a drum oh, okay. next to the bridge, right? Yeah. And there's some impaled guy in the water. I guess it's one of the writers, right? Yeah. So basically this scene, they pull up. There's this amazing music. It goes on for a long time, like mm-hmm. you said. But I have to mention now that, my God, does this movie look good. Oh, yeah. The cinematography, like many Italian movies, yeah. is incredible right and the amount of money that was spent on this movie was staggering like we're getting giant wide shots of the bronx i mean the widest lens you could imagine Mm. there's like dozens of these riders that pull up to this bridge incredible shots i mean the focus everything the lighting it's just beautiful yeah and it's just like <laughs> wasted. What we're, on yeah, like what we're this. filming is, does not make any sense. Again, but, typical Italian horror film, you know, action thriller. It just something there is just missing. Like, it's like my it, god, though, the amount of work that went into the, the look of this yeah. movie is insane. Yeah, the, the sets are all just perfectly decorated, like to a T. You yeah. know, yeah. everything is just everybody's <laughs> outfits, makeup, everything. <laughs> they spend so much fucking time yeah. on this movie. Yeah. 
It's insane. Uh, I would say if my review would be a big overture, little show. <laughs> Like when you saw the Spider-Man musical, Chris is one of the only people oh, that yeah. saw that. And I you, saw that. you were at the one where he got stuck, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> Spider-Man was swinging around and the audience is going nuts. And we're on like the balcony level. And uh, there's a part where he swings back down on the stage to get Mary Jane. And uh, they're supposed to go up. And his, uh, like, uh, you know, his carabiner or whatever it is, he hooks into both of them. is isn't working. And she's just like smiling, staring up at the crowd. And then you get the uncomfortable silence. And then the audience starts doing the, the, uh, the, the pity laughter. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 and then, and then Spider Man goes goes with it. He goes, I swear, this is the first time this has ever happened to me. <laughs> and then, like when he went up into the Raptors, and yeah. he go, no refunds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So okay. <laughs> Very much like this movie. Lots yeah. of production. Yeah. They didn't worry about the script so much. No. So, or in this movie, anybody talking, because they're like, we'll just fill it in later. Yeah. <laughs> the producer got He's like, well, we can't use any of this shit. All done. Get in some actors. They're just going to talk over the movie. We'll, yeah. we'll release it. Somebody will watch it Everyone's somewhere. mouth is just going peas and carrots, peas and carrots, peas and carrots. And, you know, say what you want over that. So, basically, all right. So, all the writers are there, and they look at this dead guy, right? Mm-hmm. And then these other guys pull up. So this rival gang pulls up, which we're going to find out is the Tigers. And so apparently these guys, this gang, yeah. is like a bunch of pimps or men who dress like pimps. So good. Do so they, they s- all have like different, like solid colored shirts, yeah. right? So yeah. like Fred Williamson wears a solid red shirt and there'll be like a guy with like a solid purple shirt, mm. all buttoned up, very nicely pressed, by the way, ironed, you know, mm. again. <laughs> I don't know where Dry this is cleaned. coming from. Perfect. Not a speck of dirt. Yeah. <laughs> no man's land Bronx, right? <laughs> and they all drive incredibly clean, like, Cadillacs and, like, these old-timey cars yeah. that are, like, shiny, like, with new paint jobs. And they, like, a lot of them wear, like, fedoras with, like, little feathers coming out of it and everything. A lot of these guys will ride on the side of the car, never yeah, inside. Right and there's no side. one inside the car riding. So who the fuck are they waiting? Like, like a guy's riding on the side yeah. holding the steering wheel. <laughs> like, and there's no one in there. <laughs> it's all about it's all about looks it's in this Bronx, looks. Chris. It's the, it's all it's about... the presentation, you know. <laughs> so basically, what we find out is like Fred Williamson comes up and he t- he says something like how this guy that's on a stick was a traitor or mm-hmm. something. Yeah. And how some of the guys found some device on him. The all gizmo. they say is it's a gizmo. Yeah. yeah. It's just a watch. And it's... basically, he tells Trash like, "Hey, he was a spy or something." Yeah. That's it. By the way, this thread will go nowhere. Yeah. We'll, we'll just forget about it. Forget we ever mentioned this fucking scene because mm-hmm. we'll never go back to it. Yeah. Other than the fact that we've now introduced Fred Williamson's character, yeah. which I guess you can or, you know, you could have saved for later. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's this, just a, a weird drumming sound in the background. I'm like, there's just a drummer intercut, interspersed. And this goes cuts. on for a good five minutes, yeah, this scene. I, it's it's it was, a lot of looking. Yeah. Beautiful shots, yeah. by the way, but a lot of just nothing. Yeah. So then we immediately go to a helicopter, right? And mm. so these guys are flying over the Bronx, which looks lovely, by the way. Mm. Oh, it's beautiful. You know, appearances are everything except for the town. They, they spend a lot of time dressing themselves up and dressing up their weapons and everything like mm. that. But the buildings they live in, they're like, I could do without it. You know? Yeah. It's all about what we do in the daytime. At yeah. night, you know. <laughs> and this is the real Bronx that they're flying over in some parts. And oh, boy, does it it looks like a place you don't want to be. No. So they're looking for the girl, right? Mm. And we'll find out who is this, the Manhattan Company or something. That's just the name of it. Yeah. Which is apparently the company that runs Manhattan and does all sorts of like weapons and all of these things. And they're looking for this girl. So we go back to the writers and they discuss, they basically talk about how this guy was a spy and that they don't trust Fred Williamson. Yeah. Okay. And then we go back to Manhattan, the city of Manhattan. And these two guys from the beginning, the office guys. Yeah. Well, I don't even think we find out their names, right? They're just talking about finding the girl. And apparently we learned, Chris, that she is, quote, the wealthiest girl in the world. <laughs> she's like heir to some company, you know? Yeah, which we will find out. She's the yeah. heir to the Manhattan Company, which is like some sort of weapons company. And for some reason, no reason at all, she just decided to run to the Bronx because she was having... Her... By the way, this girl was only 17 when this movie was filmed as oh, well. Jesus. Apparently, she was just having some sort of teenage angst and was like, <laughs> You know what, Dan? I'm going to run to the Bronx, and then you'll see. Yeah. And yeah. then she does. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a real like, woman now. He's like, fine, I don't give a fuck. Go out there. I don't care. You'll come back. Yeah. And she didn't come back. So yeah. it, Sometimes it works. 
In this case, it didn't. She called his bluff. <laughs> <laughs> so let me go back to the writer's place, which looks a lot like the Thrasher house. I yeah. mean, they, oh my they God. didn't have the same set decorator, yeah. but they could have. Uh, it, it was missing like a, a, a half pipe. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But like they got the same type of paint on the walls, yeah. you know. Everything able- okay, and every one of these, you know, homesteads or you know, squats. There's always the word shit spray painted. Yeah, did you see a shit in this one? Oh yeah, <laughs> big time. So basically, this whole scene, the purpose is like trash is like I should take you home. She's like I don't mm-hmm. want to go home, and he's like okay, you can still be my girlfriend because I found you. <laughs> Then we go to the Bronx streets, right? And so the cops have come into the Bronx. This is so important that the cops have finally come back into the no man's land to look for this girl. And they're just riding around in this like armored vehicle. And all that happens is the riders just get on top of the roof and they write, they spray paint shit on the windshield. <laughs> and then it just ends. Yeah. You know, nice little prank. We'll yeah. never see these cops again. That's a wrap. Why we needed this, I don't know. But he did spray paint it uh, in the mirror reflective sense. So yeah, he did a good write. job. He I did guess. great. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how many takes it took to get that or how many times they oh, practiced. Oh, imagine having to clean that up. Oh, god damn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then we go back to the daggers. I, I mean, the writers hang out. Right? Daggers. <laughs> And so Vic Morrow, who's dressed as a mailman, is now come to town, okay? Yeah. And he's the hammer. So then Morrow, all right, <laughs> Morrow walks into this building, and there's people, like, kind of fucking on these stairs, right? <laughs> and then, so I guess this is the writer's base. I mean, I don't know where we are, really. Yeah. And then Vic Morrow just kind of spins around. Like, so he's there's these people fucking on the stairs. Yeah. And then he's, he's got like, like a oh, like a, a mailing tube. Yeah, he's like, I got a delivery. Yeah, he's got this mailing tube, and so he spins around. Yeah, and he he kind of forces his finger into this mailing tube, and basically there's a shotgun concealed in here, and it's the most beautifully orchestrated scene again. Oh, blows this guy away. Yeah, like the chest just explodes. Yeah, and then he shoots the woman for no too. reason. For the no woman reason. gets gets off. Really, neither of them need to be shot. They yeah. don't have weapons. Yeah. They're just like, what are you doing? Oh, God. Yeah. Well, he does threaten Vic Morrow. Yeah. Yeah, like, you're going to die. You know, oh, yeah, If, if yeah. you stay here, you're going to die. If you leave, you're going to die. So, yeah, I would be inclined to kill him before he killed me. Yeah, there you so, go. So, Morrow's like the woman the had no weapon. She's like, oh, my God, no. Well, no, he Dead. got a, well, he got a twofer. What do you want? <laughs> he had he had two in the chamber, you know. What are you going <laughs> to do? Like, yeah, <laughs> don't let him go to waste. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So then Morrow starts shooting the place up and lighting fires. Uh, he's just running through this base and everybody's running. He looks a lot like Charles Bronson in Death Wish 3 at this point. Oh, definitely. Uh, so then Morrow, he just leaves at one point and then the writers go chasing after him. And Morrow like, gets away in a semi-truck mm-hmm. that's mysteriously appeared and he just kind of jumps in it. We're going to find out this man, by the way, who drives this pickup truck, has one of the best names in a movie I've ever seen. And he also has a bizarre quirk, which we're going to get into. Mm-hmm. Morrow gets in that truck. The riders go after him. And then Vic Morrow like, gets out on a bridge. They pull over the truck, and he's not in there. But we find out the guy who's driving the truck, right? So we meet this character. His name is Hot Dog. Yeah. And apparently he has, like, a, I guess one foot that's shorter than the other because he wears his boot that's, like, a big platform boot and a regular boot. Yeah, we noticed that. They don't really kind of go into it other than, like, at some point they call him, like, a club foot or something. Like, I have no idea what it is, but it's some bizarre characteristic. Yeah, they didn't really touch upon it other than that. I felt like it could have been a better story element. Like, maybe there's, like, a, you know, a fan of Switchblades inside of it or something, you know? Yeah. No, no, it doesn't really go Nothing anywhere. It goes anywhere, yeah. So we go back to the base, right? And apparently Morrow left this ring behind. Yeah. I guess it's its calling card, like the wet bandits or something. Yeah, it looks like, like a it's like it looks like a door knocker almost. Yeah, or it looks like something you get out of like a, a little vending machine as a kid. You know, like a skull ring. Yeah, like one of those, yeah. Something you buy at Spencer Gifts, you okay. know. He just went in and he bought a whole dozen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, this will be great. This will be great when I kill people. I'll just leave a couple of these behind. A little calling card, John. Call the hammer. (laughs) You've been hammered. So (laughs) they look at the ring, and there's they know some sort of connection, but I don't really know what's going on. They would just go to a funeral, so they give them the old Star Wars funeral, Mm -hmm. where basically they put them on a a Star Wars or a Viking funeral, where they just put them on a pile of wood and burn the bodies. Yeah, torch them. We kind of watch up for a while. And then we go back to the office, right? And so these guys, they're talking to Vic Morrow, and they're all pissed. And apparently we learned that they have paid him a million dollars to go get this girl back. A million dollars. And I wonder, I go, well, I hope that wasn't all up front. (laughs) (laughs) I would hope not either. 
<laughs> yeah, because at this point, I don't blame him. Like, he's like, oh, no, I'm just going to go have some fun. Yeah, man. Like, knock, <laughs> knock some back, blow some people away. Say, oh, you know, it got messy. I can't tell you anything else other than... They say they say they paid him a million bucks, and then the office guy hangs up the phone and he goes, "His record is bad." And I write, "What, <laughs> what are you giving him a million dollars for?" <laughs> He's the only choice. Also, his record's really bad. Also, we paid you a million dollars. Is the girl back yet? <laughs> and then we're gonna find out that Vic Morrow is less interested in getting that girl back than just doing like literally anything else. Yeah. He could care fucking less about getting this girl back, and that will continue throughout the whole movie. Is where I start to have some real issues with this movie is that nobody gives a fuck about the main problem in the movie. Yeah. They avoid it at all costs. They're more interested in doing dances with each other and like going to say hi to their friend gangs and like <laughs> Okay, because this is where they lost me because for the longest time I had no idea where the what the fuck was going on. Yeah. Like I lost the plot so many times because they avoided it. They okay. almost like they like they 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 kept stomping on a trash can that was like overflowing. They got no, don't let it spill out. This plot, no, keep it in. You know, like, <laughs> somebody's like change the bag, and they're like, not yet. <laughs> that was how I felt. Because honestly, they do everything they can to avoid the plot. <laughs> yeah, everything they can yeah. to avoid the main conflict of this movie. They're like, well, we'll get to it. Yeah, it's there. Trust us. We don't. We don't forget. Yeah. But we'll get we'll, let us let us have a little fun. Yeah, you the, know? the plot itself is its own plot and payoff in their minds. Let's explore this world a little bit longer, <laughs> for like an hour and yeah. twenty minutes. Yeah, <laughs> then in the last three minutes, we'll we'll figure it out. Basically, we go back. Okay, we go back to the writers, right? Yeah, and they're talking about that ring Morrow left behind still. And then the gang wants to go to war, but Trash says no. And this is when I write, the dubbing on this movie has now become very obvious. The ADR is just hilariously bad. Oh, it's out of sync. I thought, like, I got this, uh, again, you can get this on Amazon Prime for free to stream. Yes, I thought, and it looks amazing. By yes, way. and the quality, it, 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 looks high, it looks like it's in HD, but it's not, it's just that good. I thought there was something wrong with the buffering for a minute and i know re- it's yeah it's just the adr is so bad that, that it, it's actually off sync with its own actors that's just how bad it was it's very very off sync. yeah like hilariously bad though mm. and trash's voice does not match him no. at all no <laughs> nobody's voice does so trash says he's gonna go off to find this girl right mm. because she quote went off to think I love that. I need to go think. <laughs> and then he drives down this tunnel that the roller skate gang in all white. I get. Okay, so this is amazing. Yeah. So she's gone off to think by the water. All right. So Trash goes to find her and he goes through that tunnel where the roller skate gang hangs out the zombies, right? Yeah. And when Trash passes by on his motorcycle, they're like, oh, we're going to set a trap for him. So their version <laughs> of a trap is like a piece of plywood that stands straight up. Yeah. That covers maybe, I'd say, a third of the tunnel. I, w- I would say maybe three feet. Yeah, and they put it in the middle of the road. Yeah. And I just write my my notes, well, that could be dodged very easily. <laughs> like, I would just hop off and, like, kick it to the like, side. It literally only takes up a third of the tunnel. They yeah. could just, you know, swerve around. Yeah, I could stick up my foot and kick it out of the way as I'm riding past it. Like, you li- maybe could just lean on the motorcycle <laughs> and get past it. Like, yeah. it, it might not even take a turn. Like, it's... it's, it's Literally just a tiny little piece of wood that doesn't cover anything. So he drives away, right? And then we we go to Hot Dog. And basically, we learn that Hot Dog and Morrow, they're in on it. And there's this... I also questioned, why did they dub Vic Morrow? He's an American actor. Yeah. Could use his own fucking voice. So this is not his voice is using. No. And... No. Yeah. That's the weird thing about this. Yeah, and for some reason they've they've ADR'd everything. Like they didn't even have a like maybe the boom operator just never showed up and they're like, well, well we still gotta film. We gotta have ten camera assistants, but well, there's probably so much noise going on where they're filming because they're trying to make it like this desolate post apocalyptic land that you've got sounds of cars in the background, horns honking. It's there New literally York, is no Bronx. sound in this movie. Yeah, except I, for the music, the fighting, yeah. and like the voices. And that I, helped add to the desolation of it because yeah. if you did have the actual on set sound, you would would have no none of that it would just be a mess and so that's that's it that's a smart vote on their yeah. part not smart to not sync it properly and not use the original actors voices so we learn that this girl is supposed to be the president of the manhattan corporation mm. which i guess is what those office guys are a part of <laughs> okay <laughs> i yeah. mean i guess 
I mean, I don't think that's her dad. We never find that out. No. They just say, get the girl. Yeah. They don't even call her Anne. They're just like, get that girl. She's just that, that girl. I never knew her By name. By the way, it's like, okay, so has Vic Morrow met her? Or they just they, they just go, hey, uh, can you go pick up the one white girl in the Bronx, please? Thank you. And then just hang up. <laughs> By the way. And he goes and brings back the whip girl from later. Like, yeah. oh, no, that's, I'm sorry, the other one. Yeah, he walks outside. <laughs> and there's a bag of $1 million. <laughs> He's like, you said the white girl. I brought it. I'm taking my million. Yeah. Vic Morrow asks Hot Dog to help him, right? And this is great because he go- Hot Dog goes, well, how much am I going to get paid? And Vic Morrow just looks at him and he goes, don't you ever ask me that. Yeah. And I just write, well, I mean, Morrow, you are making a cool million. You can't share a little, just a little bit of that wealth. Yeah. <laughs> like, just maybe send a few bucks his way. Like a, out of a million dollars like a handful of 50s and that'll be fine <laughs> like jesus christ yeah don't you ever ask me that it's like good god i, f- I feel like uh, this guy wants to keep this money and make out make his you know, buy his own gang yeah maybe Morrow's gonna start his own gang yeah the horse flamethrower gang yeah we'll find horse. out so Morrow asks him he's do- he's not gonna pay him he's like you're only my intern mm. okay because you're not good enough yet hot dog mm-hmm. Maybe if you intern for a while and work mm. real hard for a couple months, maybe, maybe there will be a paid job at the end of this. <laughs> no but guarantee. maybe, but probably not. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not giving you class credit either. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to set up a meeting with Ice, who's basically like Trash's right hand man, like yeah. second in command. We have a theory about Ice is that uh, he was he's basically this he used to be like the suburban dad. He just, certainly looks like it. And he just decided he just wanted to walk away from it all like the wife the kids it was just like so you mean like this. this might be the dad from the van like he finally got so fed up I with that think, yeah i think this is a midlife like, crisis eh, midlife crisis situation where he just wanted to start a new life faked his own death or just disappeared and just crossed and that bridge that bronx yeah crossed that bridge and never looked back literally crossed that bridge he looks almost like james spader in stargate with those yeah he glasses does he with does that. with the hair, hair and, and the glasses, and the glasses yeah. and his yeah. nazi outfit daniel's in there you know <laughs> Trying to find those symbols. <laughs> that again, okay. The Nazi outfit, the paraphernalia. Like, where do they? What museum? Where do they find? Well, this he stuff? looks like a white supremacist. Yeah. I guess I'd say he looks like what actually. They should have dubbed him in with like a German guy. Oh yeah, crosses the bridge to the <laughs> Or like a, maybe an aggressive German guy. Like, ah, yeah, yeah, that would have been better. So Morrow just says, uh, Morrow, by the way, killing it in this movie. Just yeah. fucking killing it, even though his, all his lines are 80 yard. I love this line as he goes, you're playing with fire. Hot mm. dog says to him, he goes, you're playing with fire. And Morrow goes, I know. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> he, he couldn't retort like, you're going to feel the burn pretty soon. <laughs> So we go to the beach, right? And so Trash and the girl are just kind of hanging out. It's Trash gives some very poetic. This is like the first scene of this movie where yeah. we're going to get these like very poetic speeches about life yeah. and death and this how is we a, It's a very hating Christensen episode 2. Uh, yeah, moment. Yeah. <laughs> Like she's sitting on the beach and she's like something about I'm not afraid of death or something and Trash is like death surrounds us it lives with me every day it walks with me like a friend I hug it I feed it I and he's like going and there's some like sort of poem yeah and it's like very he must have you know Trash I guess that um, you know English poetry degree (laughs) over at NYU didn't work out for the job so well so he he went across the bridge decided this is these are my people this is the. (laughs) My only platform. <laughs> this is my stage. This girl is my only audience. These people appreciate my poetry. Yeah. I'm going to just live out here for now. Yeah. Until that, until the economy picks up a little, you know. <laughs> and there's a need for poets in this world. Yeah. That's, the city rebuilt itself with the arts. So basically, we learn kind of about the Manhattan Corporation. She tells them she's supposed to be the president. They're apparently some arms dealer, and if she's can't, if she's there, they can't have her inherit the company or something. I'm like, yeah. There's so there's nobody next in line, right? Like, like is there no <laughs> other heir? Like, yeah, is the mom or just, dead? Like, they couldn't like give it to the other another guy or something, there's or like another a, girl that worked there, or like a shareholder, you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's not like a board of directors, and like, well, I guess you know, we'll give it to this guy. He was gonna do a hostile takeover anyways you know he's, he seems he's a real go-getter 
So Trash just says more poetic shit about dying for her, and then they share a moment, right? And then, yeah. so they ride back. There's that roadblock, Chris. I, I swear to God, it, I thought I saw, like, pots and pans hanging from it at one point. <laughs> so the thing is, like, you would say, okay, so maybe they put the roadblock in the middle of the road, and then the guys would stand on the sides of it. Yeah. No, it's literally just the roadblock, and Trash, like, he, he looks at it, he's like, wait, oh, oh, shit. There's something in the middle of the road. Yeah. I've got to stop. I can't go around it. Yeah. And he just stops dead, like, confused as all hell, like, well, what do we do? <laughs> and then that gang comes out and just quite kind of choreographed dances around. They yeah. grab the girl and spin off. And then they just kind of, like, they throw a net. Okay, over. the net was the best part. <laughs> because the net is... Okay, usually when you throw a net on someone, it's to capture them. It's to take them away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is... But this net, by the way, is... yeah. I mean, he could he could just take it and throw it off. Yeah, it's not weighed down by weights no. or anything. No. It's just literally like somebody threw a little cargo net mm-hmm. over you, and you would just throw it off and be like, "Very funny." I think this is the same net from Super Chick that she dressed yeah, herself yeah, yeah. in. It's like a fish net. Yeah, it, it's like a big fish. There's net. no weight to this. No, like you throw it on top of him, he'd just be like, "Oh, that's fine. I'll very, just I'll take it off." Very funny. But he's like, ah, and he kind of <laughs> choreographs his. <laughs> the struggle. He's like pretending he's a mime in a box with this thing, you know. He's like the walls, the walls, <laughs> and they kind of just spin skate off with the girl, yeah. and then they kind of go over and like, like they're hitting him with a steel chair and wrestling or something, yeah. just kind of, kind of glancing him with, yeah, the, like, <laughs> <laughs> glancing him with the sticks. Not, not too hard though. Yeah, they, they don't want to hurt him. They're doing the old Vince McMahon on him. You know? <laughs> they don't want to put a bruise on him. No. You know, just kind of glance him a little bit. <laughs> Trash. Trash doesn't have a cut on him. No. And he gets up and he's all confused. I wonder how long it took him to get his bike around that roadblock if he ever figured that out. Yeah. It's like a fucking Rubik's Cube to this guy. <laughs> he's just like, wait, do I, wait, hold on. Should I pick it up? Wait, can I maybe turn the bike? Oh, fuck. I'm, you know what? I'm going to go the other way. He turns it upside down. <laughs> I'm going down. back to the beach. I, this is a real, <laughs> yeah, a real a, head scratcher. This a head scratcher for sure. <laughs> <laughs> got an MC Escher painting over here. So he he finally, like hours yeah. later, makes it back to his gang. And they're just like, hey, where's that girl? And he's like, yeah, she was kidnapped. And he's all, okay, well, I want to go get her back. Yeah. But I'm going to have to go through like 10 other gangs. Again, video game, level <laughs> one. Like, I got to go through level one first. Yeah. <laughs> I got to level up. Yeah. So I'm not really ready to go get her just yet. Yeah. Uh, like, who wants to come with me? And he takes like three guys. Someone right? pr- please press start for the player two of the icon to appear. <laughs> And he names off all these gags, right? And I was half expecting one to be called the daggers. Oh God, I was he's hoping like, that the sharks, the the tigers, yeah. the zombies, the daggers. <laughs> I was just expecting it. So then we go to the roller skate gang, the zombies, then mm. their clubhouse, which is amazing. Mm. They got like tires on strings that are painted oh white God. that hang from the ceiling. Yeah, they have like cutout figures. There's a lot of choreographed moves and spins going on. Everybody's practicing their spins and their moves. But there's not one guy in a crop top and like a headband like <laughs> snapping like telling everyone okay start from the top and again from yeah, one well, everybody we, we didn't walk in on that part no not uh, yet no <laughs> they're actually they actually have uh that job opening they oh, haven't yeah. filled it yet they're looking for a choreographer <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it's amazingly well stocked for the apocalypse yeah and very clean yeah. by the way not a speck of dirt on the yeah, floor where, again it. where they find white tires <laughs> Yeah, they painted them. Yeah. Like, they take so much fucking time with all this <laughs> For stuff. white tires. <laughs> and they're all just practicing their fights. Like, like it's some sort of fencing, but all acted out. You mm-hmm. know, like you're doing a pirate fight on a stage or something. Like you're yeah. in sixth grade and you're like, okay, and then I'll go here and you go here. And they're fighting each other, which makes no sense. It's like some kind of Four Musketeers musical. They're ready for the. They're getting ready for the five o'clock show. Yeah. The crowd should be a little bigger. Mm, you yeah. Know. They're trickling in around 430, but they're going to be ready. <laughs> I almost half expect them. They well, we never find out why they kidnapped this girl because they have no idea. Like, okay, here you go. You have them connected with the hammer yeah. or the Manhattan Project guys, Manhattan Corporation guys, right. and saying like, "Can you go get that girl?" There's a hit. They should have had it. Like, they should have had somebody fly over and drop flyers that have a wanted poster Ooh. and say one million dollars if you find this girl. Yeah. 
Then all the gangs would want to kidnap her. Yeah. That's so fucking easy. But instead, he kidnaps the, her to, I don't know. He's like, hey, Trash found that girl first, and I'm jealous that it's his girlfriend. I want a girlfriend, too. You know how hard it is to find a woman in this apocalypse? <laughs> they never come across the bridge, and Trash always gets everything. Yeah. I'm going over there, and I'm taking that girl. Yeah, you take her. You take her. <laughs> So they bring her back to the base. By the way, nobody does anything with her because I can't even wait till later in this movie. There is a part where she's chained up, but there's also a part, I think, where she's just kind of wandering around checking out the sights. So. And she's chained up and she's kind of holding on to the chain like, <laughs> like if I don't hold on to this chain, I won't be like you know, restrained, Chris, right? My theory is that she's actually not chained up in that scene and that mm. it's just some sort of workout. And we'll get to that. We'll <laughs> get to that. It's a stretch. <laughs> it turns some kind it's of... just maybe a part of the act. You know? Yeah. So, <laughs> trash and the boys, all right? Yeah. So, they go into some random building, and, okay, now, this is also where I have a big problem. Apparently, even though you could just go down to the beach and meet the zombies, because they always hang out in that tunnel, mm. right? Yeah. They have to take the long road, and we have to go level one, okay? Yeah. We can't just go straight to them. Yeah. Which, apparently, by the way, the zombies live maybe two minutes from where the writers are. Easily. They could just go to the base Easily. right now and get her back. Easily. And by the way, they can just anybody can just walk into this base, as we'll find out later in the movie. But no, we got to go to level one, Chris. So, oh my God, then Ugh. they go in a random building, and these guys... <laughs> I don't know how to explain this. Other oh, God. They walk into a building with a bunch of pillars. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Do you think this gang were like waiting outside looking like, oh, so oh for so sure, coming, for so sure. So coming. <laughs> there was a like, lookout guy going, they're here, they're here, they're here. Yeah. Somebody's here. Get behind, get behind it. Yeah. <laughs> everyone, everyone on places, one. Places, places. <laughs> and on one, please. And one, two. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So they're all behind pillars, okay? And this shot is like they walk into an empty room and there's all these pillars. And then all of a sudden, like on cue, all of them spin out. Yeah. Right? They all do a little pirouette out. And they, my God, Chris, what I wrote down is a mix between magicians and mimes. <laughs> I, th- I, put, I put clockwork orange. <laughs> They are like they are like clockwork, like, but they all have like metal bowler hats on, yeah. Because you can see the rivets in mm-hmm. them, so like they're I guess they're wearing really heavy steel <laughs> bowler hats. hard hats. Because they yeah, only it's... wear that for the show, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> uh, they serve no purpose other than weighing down themselves. <laughs> expertly painted faces yeah. by the way i mean like the lines are perfect there's not a bead of sweat on this nothing is smeared or anything yeah. and they all have these silver suits on and matching silver canes and they just do a little pirouettes out and they're like duh, 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 duh. and <laughs> <laughs> they do all these like choreographed steps and then they kind of spin swing us uh there's Kate at the guys and they're like oh no yeah <laughs> this is clockwork orange like clockwork orange on ice <laughs> and by the way soft jazz music plays yeah and i was like i wonder if this is just in the soundtrack or if it was a part of the room it's been played in the room <laughs> So many press play on the tape player, and that's their yeah. cue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, how, or how else are they going to stay in sync with each other? Like, they're not looking at each other. Yeah, like I go, there's like a, a conductor going like, one, two, yeah. one, two. Yeah. Or someone's like tapping their cane on the pavement just so they don't know in time. They, so we get this spin fight. These guys have a perfect, I mean, a perfect ballet yeah. uh, routine down. They're all wearing like tights, by the way. Mm. <laughs> like I said, there's no more work on Broadway. If you want to go somewhere and practice, you got to go to the Bronx. Yeah. Like, that's where the real art is being done now. <laughs> Broadway is for a bunch of sellouts. The yeah. real art's being done in the Bronx. Yeah. I could see, like, tour buses coming through, and they're like, okay, we're going to see some urban art today. Mm-hmm. They're very good. They won't hurt you. Just keep your distance. Yeah. But it's incredibly choreographed. You'll never see anything like this. <laughs> Just keep all valuables wallets inside the bus at all times. <laughs> like, maybe they thought this was a tour group coming in. They're like, oh, shit, it's a gang. <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> like, they're using just, like, a bunch of old people coming in with yeah. cameras going, yeah. like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> they signed some maps. Some dad with a big VHS camcorder <laughs> over his shoulder. He's like, look, son. <laughs> go, go run up there and let him hit you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> go ask the twirl his Can cane. you get a picture? Can yeah. you get a picture, sir? Try on his hat. Let him see if let him try. In the hat. <laughs> 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 you know, 
this photo. They got him like up on their shoulders <laughs> and the hat on and everything. And then, like there's one guy at the bottom doing the thriller pose, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Happy birthday! <laughs> Which, by the way, if you don't think there's a birthday party in this movie, just <laughs> wait. Just no, what I was waiting for them to like at the end or at the beginning of this, like throwing out confetti out of their hand, just like some kind of Rip Taylor bir- streamers. Well, okay, if you don't think there's a birthday party and a cake, you're wrong. <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> oh my god, the confections of this movie <laughs> and where they made this cake. I, we will get to that. And the amount of time is, they had to prepare. Holy it. shit! Yeah. <laughs> So, all right. So they beat up a few of the writers, yeah. And then the leader of this gang spins in, right? Yeah. yeah. And she Spin, is, literally. She spins does. In. She spins yeah. in. She goes trash. Zoom and spins in, and she's wearing an all gold suit, mm-hmm. right? And she looks at him, and she's like, "Hey, you're trespassing." And he's like, "Hey, we need to get to the other side of the Bronx. We decided to go the long way instead of just kind of driving down where the we build, usually this, do." This route builds character. We decided not to take the road. <laughs> We decided to give the bikes a rest for the day, and we're just going to walk there. Yeah. Uh, But we had to walk through this building for some reason. We couldn't take the street. And he's like, hey, um, so can we get through? And she's like, all right, show's over. Thank you. Uh, By the way, Willie will be walking around with the hat. If you want to leave a little something, (laughs) we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Keep the theater going. There is a tour bus coming through in three minutes, so you guys got to go. Okay, We got to get back to one. Everybody back to one. Yeah. So that <laughs> Trash and the boys, now they go through some tunnels because apparently taking the streets like normal people is is just out of the fucking question, okay? So we're mm. going to go through every sort of tunnel to get there. And then, this is what I also write, to get anywhere in the Bronx, you have to traverse a video game land. Yep. So now we're in level two, Yeah. okay? And I write dungeons, shops, finding weapons. <laughs> I mean, it's like Double Dragon, it is. Streets of Rage, or maybe like an RPG or something, you know? It's yeah. just like um, there's River pow- City Ransom, if you ever played that yeah, game. Yeah, there's like power-ups here and there, you know? <laughs> if if there was a part where Trash found like a drink and he just opens it and goes, gook, 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 and then goes, yeah, like flexes, <laughs> flexes I would have yeah. been surprised. No. <laughs> it's like, and- a, like a glowing potion that kind of pulsates <laughs> like a blinking light above it. Yeah, like a, a red glowing drink. Yeah. Somebody's like, go oh, trash, I'm hurt. He's like, hold on, I got a health potion. Yeah. <laughs> Pours it on the wound. So apparently they have entered scavenger territory. And I, I, this is when I theorized, Chris, I'm like, I wonder if like for tourists, they have like kind of a Disneyland map for this, the Bronx. <laughs> and they're like, so this is scavenger land. Yeah. Here's mime world. Mm-hmm. Here's roller world. You know, and they got all like uh, the different <laughs> it's areas. It's all mapped you know? out. Yeah. <laughs> There's like a gift shop at the end for like you can buy the costumes of each gang. Like, <laughs> you know, if they wanted to make Bronx No Man Land, they got a real good opportunity for tourism yeah. in this area. Yeah. Let the buses in. You guys can make it a great living with this. You're doing yeah. all this work for these, nothing. These buses have like bars on their windows, though. It's like a it's like chicken wire cages like, it's on the bus windows. <laughs> Maybe like, they're all upset because they're like, hey, Trash, we're trying to put on a show, man. Get out of our territory, <laughs> <Yeah>. okay? <laughs> this is our money. Yeah. <laughs> you stick to your world. I know nobody wants to go near that <laughs> shitty beach, but this yeah. is our real estate. Mm-hmm. Prime position, mm-hmm. okay? <laughs> we're the twirl gang, all right? Your costume does not match the theme of what we're lying or bert- <laughs> the land we're portraying. You ruin it all. <laughs> yeah, you're messing it all up. <laughs> so then they walk down this hall, and these people called the, quote, scavengers follow them. Basically, these people are dressed in like burlap sacks this is the the least presentable of least, the gangs this, this is, is the one that lives underground you yeah know? well they have no nothing to show to anybody they're underground yeah it's like they ran out of ideas yeah for this gang they're like oh shit i don't know what do we do well uh, they, they so went to throw the, a potato sack on them well they went to the wardrobe department and this was all they had left was you know everyone else the writers got the good stuff yeah and everyone the- else did <laughs> So they're stuck with the potato sacks, yeah, which they is got, like the they catering got... trucks, leftover <laughs> yeah. sacks of potatoes. It's that and everything that the customs were in originally when they got shipped <laughs> to the department. And then like, because they, they had that bucket where they were dipping those tires in white paint. Yeah. So then they made all these guys dip their heads in it because <laughs> the scavengers are just wearing these like potato sacks. And yeah. then it looks like they took, everybody took their head and dunked it into a thing of white paint because yeah. their head their hair is all covered in white paint and their face is but it's all shittily so it's yeah. like they, like they were bobbing for apples in a bucket of paint yeah like a blue man group but yeah. with white paint which by the way there will be a blue man group person in this <laughs> there movie will be. Yeah, there will be I know. <laughs> <laughs> and i write they also all walk around like quasimodo like they all walk <laughs> around like they're the hunchback what the fuck is wrong with these people <laughs> 
<laughs> and by the way, so these guys, their only weapon that they yeah. carry is just two by fours. Yeah. Nicely cut, by the way, mm-hmm. like fresh from Home Depot, because mm-hmm. they're all the perfect length. They're, <laughs> no sharp edges, by the way. They're all blunt objects, okay? Yeah. Like a regular two by four, mm-hmm. like you would use for a fence post, but without the, st- the stick part. You right. Know? The initiation, do you think, is just like you got to walk a certain way. You got to walk with a hunch. I think if, like, if, if you didn't want to, if you didn't make it in the magician mime ba- yeah. gang yeah. or the roller gang, yeah. or you didn't want to be a pimp. You, you, went, t- you went with the Quasimodos. Well, you didn't want to be a pimp because there were no hoes to be seen. Those that pimp. Well, there gang. was only one girl in the right. whole thing. Right. Also, there's the leader of the spin gang is right. is a lady. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the one girl you don't want to cross. She's got a whip. Yeah. No. 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 Unless that's the kind of so thing. The, but the scavengers are at the bottom of the barrel. They also live underground. Yeah. They've relegated them to the bad area mm-hmm. of the the theme park. Well, they were the least creative. Yeah. Nobody so, really goes down there. They're, they're, it's getting old. It's this getting is, dingy. They are the, like the manager is looking to upgrade the area yeah. soon, though. They might give it a re uh, like a, a facelift, if yeah, you will. They, they yeah. are like the Toontown of Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> They're like a we're critter country or something. Yeah. Like the one that like nobody ever goes out no, there unless no. you're going to Splash Mountain. Yeah, if you, yeah, if you've never been, it's like a dead end. Like, oh well, you're like, shit. What the fuck is critter country? No, like when you go past um when you go past Thunder Mountain and there's just that zoo. Like yeah. that's the place that nobody <laughs> goes out to. You know, They're, you're like, wait, there's a zoo in Disneyland? Where <laughs> yeah. the fuck did I go? Yeah, <laughs> this isn't on the map. <laughs> what is Zooland? What the fuck? <laughs> Now, these Quasimodo gangs, right? One of them kills one of the riders. He just has a bunch of two-by-fours sticking out of him. And I yeah. go, wait a second. There's no sharp ends. No, That how did this was get a through? hell of a force that yeah. they drove into yeah. this guy. Because he's got, like, two of them sticking out of his back, and he just falls down, right? Yeah. And then, basically, trash and only one guy's left, mm-hmm. right? So they kind of get away. So Ice and Morrow and Hot Dog are now having a conversation, right? Mm. Ice is trying to explain the situation, the whole movie, to Vic Morrow, and he's just as confused as we are. Oh, yeah. Because Ice doesn't talk like a regular person. He starts saying things like, the bird flew the coop, and Morrow's like, what the fuck? (laughs) (laughs) And he goes, he goes, Little Red Riding Hood was caught by the Big Bad Seven Dwarves. And Mario just kind of gives him a look like, shut the fuck up. Everything's <laughs> said in, like, lingo, like, code that makes no sense whatsoever. And, like, he's, he looks at him, he's like, look, I know, I understand, like your theory, Chris, that you used to teach English in a, in a high school and all. Yeah. Shut the fuck up and tell me what's going on yeah. here, right? We're in the Bronx now. Yeah. We're not in the fucking Hamptons anymore, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> tell me in regular words what has <laughs> happened. <laughs> And he basically says the whole thing like, hey, oh, so that girl, I guess, that you're looking for. Actually, I don't really know why you're here, but uh, there's this girl and Trash. It was Trash's girlfriend because he found her first. And you know how it works here in the Bronx. If you find her first, she gets to be your girlfriend. Mm. And so I guess another gang wanted to kiss her or something. So they took her for the day because they wanted to put her in their show. They needed a girl. Yeah. Yeah. They needed a chained up victim for their eight o'clock show. Yeah. And so they kinda of borrowed her and now yeah. now he wants to get her back. But instead of going right to their base, he's decided to kinda of go ask Fred Williamson for help. And Vic Morrow is just as confused as we are. <laughs> And I write, wait, he wants to go ask Fred Williamson for help? Just go to the fucking base and get her back, yeah. Trash. Yeah. He's got a How gang of his own. How is Fred going to help? Yeah, you have your own goddamn gang yeah. with just as many members. Yeah. And by the way, they look like they're ready for a fight. The pimps, on the other hand, do not look like they're ready to rumble. Like- no, they're more of a take it easy kind of <laughs> gang, you know? <laughs> they look like they're down to do business. Yeah. Not to <laughs> rough and tumble. <laughs> And so Vic Morrow is very confused about all this. And then they just notice that one of the writers is spying on them. Yeah. And so then Morrow says, like, oh, okay, well, I'll uh, solve this problem somehow. <laughs> Can you, by the way, give me something that belongs to Trash for no reason? And he's like, oh, yeah, sure. And he gives him this spike stick weapon that Trash carries around for most of the movie. And then I wonder out loud, I'm like, wait a, wait a second. If that's his weapon to fight with. Why isn't it with Trash? Why isn't it with him? <laughs> yeah. He's out, like, <laughs> meandering through gangland. He just doesn't have his main weapon. He's, oh, fuck, I forgot it. You know, that and happens. we can't go back now. It's three minutes away. Well, he lost it in the last boss battle, so you, you can't get it until you beat the next level. It's a level three staff. Yeah. Okay? He can't use it yet. He's only a level two. Yeah. He's got to level up, Chris. Yeah. Yes. He's thinking by the next fight he might might upgrade to might. that weapon. Yeah. If he kills three more scavengers, he's got it. Mm. You know? He's got to grind that area really bad. <laughs> 
He's got to farm the fuck out of that fucking mime land. So then Hot Dog, Hot Dog notices the other rider spotting on them, and then Ice goes chasing after him. That's when he legit eats shit on that yeah. bike. Yeah. Like, hardcore. <laughs> wow. I mean, it's bad. I showed this part to my wife, and she was like, oh, my God. It is bad. And it definitely does not look fake. It looks like a no. man ate shit and died. And is this the- actually the actor yeah. Yeah, yeah. doing that? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. not a stuntman. No, they didn't have... It seems like they had the budget for a man for any of their shit. <laughs> the Italian guy. No, no, no. Ride the bike. It's fine. It's fine. He's like, are you sure? I've never ridden one of these before. He's like, no, it'll be fine. And then he falls and he's he's all pissed off. He's like, you you know, you signed the waiver. Yeah. Basically, yeah. <laughs> you pay. You break a deal by Oh, it. we didn't see. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't see. So then the other... Okay, the other rider pulls up where Trash and the boys have their bikes. I lost it, Chris. I fucking lost it. Because the other rider, the guy who was spying on them, yeah. runs from that semi truck immediately to where Trash is. Yeah. And I write, so why did Trash go to that fucking mind magician ballet gang if this was literally two feet from them? Was he trying to what? recruit the, the mime gang or what? No! They just go through there and they get in a fight. And he's like, we're just passing through. That's right. And she's yeah. like, well, I don't know why you had to walk in the building. <laughs> yeah. You couldn't have walked around. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, well, Thanks then- for watching. <laughs> Donations <laughs> at the door. <laughs> It's a great rehearsal, but... And then I, I fucking lost it, Chris. I said, also, why the hell don't they just go get the fucking girl back? Obviously, that roller skate zombie gang lives close to them. They always get in conflicts with mm. them. Their lands border each other. So what is the fucking point of going to talk to Fred Williams? Yeah, none. None, 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 none. Then the writer runs through this hall and he screams, trash! Like, it's almost like the beginning of a song. Yeah. <laughs> he does it in his best this is the Broadway o- uh, vocal. Yeah, this is like a, the opening number. Yeah. He runs through the tunnel. He looks at the camera and he goes, trash! Mm. And then the scavengers beat him up, okay? So Trash and his one friend left. They have now run... Okay, now I got really fucking pissed off because Trash runs around a, another building and then Vic Morrow just walks up right behind them. Mm-hmm. And again, I read, so again, where the fuck is Trash going? Obviously, people can just get right to him from the fucking street. Yeah. But he's just wandering in and out of buildings looking for items and clues and health potions. Like, what the fuck is he doing? A bigger staff. <laughs> I mean, nobody said Trash was smart. He couldn't get around that roadblock. No. But come on, man. No. Maybe you should let Ice take over that gang. Like, <laughs> there comes a time to step down, yes. <laughs> Like, you think Ice shows up and he's, you know, this 40-year-old middle-aged guy, yeah. you know, he's, he ran away from his home and he's like, mm. I, I never thought, you know, I thought I'd come down here, I I might be able to get a gang of my own. I'm stuck with a 17-year-old kid bossing me around. <laughs> <laughs> Rocking in a warehouse full of mimes. <laughs> he doesn't even know where he's going. He forgets his fucking bike, his weapon. His, I don't know yeah. what the hell the point of all this yeah. is. Go let him die. <laughs> yeah, I, I, this guy is so aimless. I, I know, he's like a lost Yeah, because then this makes even no more sense. He Okay, so Trash and this guy come out of a manhole cover. So they went from inside a building to, like, apparently in a sewer, and yeah. then they come out of the manhole like they're the fucking Ninja Turtles, yeah. and they're sneaking around the tiger territory, is what he says, <laughs> a.k.a. level three, which <laughs> I wrote, at this point... The producer must have just been like, well, we bought all these costumes. You better fucking use them, yeah. all right? He can't just go get the girl. You you ordered $20,000 in costumes for this movie. You're going to fucking use them. Yeah. Do you know how long it took to paint those burlap sacks white? <laughs> and why did we have to get all these old-timey cars? These are real cars. They're not replicas. <laughs> you know, the fucking Model T over here. Yeah. <laughs> this is a loan from a museum, <laughs> this fucking thing. You better not put any scratches on that shit. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta get that back to the museum by six. <laughs> it's unknown, kid. It's unknown. <laughs> don't ride a don't ride on the fucking side of it. Oh my god. <laughs> You're giving me a fucking heart attack over here. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I guess the tigers alright, so we see definitely they're a bunch of pimps. Yeah. Right? Or wannabe pimps. And we see only one shot of them is one portly pimp. Walks over to... By the way, this man's wearing like a leopard fedora with feathers coming out of it. Uh, If you saw him in a park, you would tell your daughter or son to run. Mm -hmm. Like, definitely he drives a van. He's looking for prey. (laughs) He's offering, you know, free puppies in the back. Yeah. And so he walks over to a car and some guy's like, hey, you want to join us? And he goes, no, I just like to watch. 
And we go into the Tiger base, right? So Fred Williamson is walking around this base, and he's just kind of giving orders to people. He's like, hey, you, go deliver the cakes over there. Hey, you, do this, do that, do this. I want my people to be happy. I'm the king around here. Mm. My subjects should be happy. And wow. In this hollowed-out shithole of a base, he has the super classy oh, yeah. uh, setup. Yeah. Even though we're in a dilapidated building. It's its own security system. He has a man playing piano, mm-hmm. which he, by the way, can order at any time for him to change the tempo, which he yeah. will. Yeah. A man in blue makeup playing bongos. <laughs> <laughs> a throne with, like, all this velvet and, like, crushed crushed velvet and it, all sorts okay. of... Okay. It looks like the set of a meatloaf music video. It <laughs> Us. And it's just it's just amazing. Yeah. Like so, Willard's got it made out in the Bronx. Oh I guess. God, how I don't know how I don't know how he was able to pull this off. How come he's living like high on the hog and everyone else is like in the shit? I, he got there first. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he drew the map. He's like, you know, oh. here's your territory. Here's yeah. this. You know, just listen yeah. to me. I'll I'll provide all the stuff you need. The tourists, you know, I'll collect the money. We'll oh. divide it all out. Don't worry, I got your back. Although those fucking scavengers, I got a lot of problems with them. So Trash and his friend, they sneak into the base, right? And then Morrow follows them. Mm. Vic Morrow's following him. Then we go back to the Tiger base, and Fred is sitting in his chair telling the piano guy, he's like, hey, pick it up. A little more lively. Right. Huh? <laughs> and then we go to the Tiger guard, okay? So this guy's like, catches Trash and his friend, and he holds him up with a gun. And Trash is like, hey, can I see Fred Williamson? And he's like, oh, okay, I guess so. And then Vic Morrow just shows up with Trash's spike stick yeah. and impales this dude. Yeah. And he fires the gun, and then basically, like, he kind of, like, holds a gun at Trash, and he's like, oh, I'm going to wait until they get up here so you get blamed for this. Yeah. And then Vic Morrow runs off, and then they catch Trash, and f- he's like, oh, hey, yeah, it wasn't me that killed that guy. It was the hammer. And Fred Williamson's like, okay, I believe you. Conflict over. Yeah, done. <laughs> we could have had a really cool side, like plot line of, like, now Trash is wrongly accused. Yeah, and now he's- no, no. Fred Williamson's yeah. like, oh, yeah, I believe you. And then Trash is like, oh, hey, can you help me get this girl I found today? Yeah. Uh, She's my girlfriend. And Fred Williams is like, oh, yeah, I heard about this broad running around the Bronx. (laughs) (laughs) Where it travels fast. Everybody's really excited because they got to put on their shows today. (laughs) I heard she's not tipping, though, and she's real rich. (laughs) I got a problem with that. Maybe we get her loose on the wallet. Is daddy around? (laughs) No, if this was like this whole film was from her perspective would be like alice in wonderland <laughs> it is yeah, yeah it really is yeah so basically like all that happens is nothing <laughs> except vic morrow calls hot dog and he goes i'll be back in 15 minutes i'd like to mention this because it's gonna get extremely confusing mm-hmm. oh there is a great part where morrow's on the radio and then the scavengers are sneaking up behind him and then vic morrow just screams turns around and fires at them And then one shows up in front of him, and he literally blows his brains out of his head. Yeah. Oh, that was insane. (laughs) I was like, that just fucking happened, didn't it? It's like, wow, I'm glad we added that. Yeah. We go back to the tiger base. Oh, yeah. So Fred is mad at Trash for like one minute, and then he's like, all right, no problem. I'll go help you get your girlfriend back. That's right, yeah. And I write, (laughs) just like, this is so dumb. So you would think, Chris, you would think... That Fred Williamson would send some soldiers or something, some of his Mm. gang members, to go with Trash. Right. No. Fred Williamson's going to go himself with his whip friend, who's this girl that has a whip. It's like like, she's dressed like... Yeah, she's like a dominatrix character almost. Yeah, or like those purple ladies in Double Dragon 2 with the whips, you know? (laughs) Or Melina (laughs) from Mortal Kombat. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So we go back to the zombie base, the roller skate base, and they're, they're practicing their dance fight choreography. They... And Ice, the I write the only intelligent, semi-intelligent person in this whole fucking movie, has gone to the zombie base. Yeah. Because apparently it is easily accessible. You don't have to go through all these tunnels and levels and everything. He goes right there and he's like, hey, can I have the girl? And I write, what a fucking novel idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's a shot of what I think is the girl just randomly wandering around the base. Like, she's looking for the fucking bathroom right. in this place. Like, I don't see her chained up in this no. scene. I think she's literally within inches of the street, like, walking towards open windows. Well, there's no glass in the windows or anything. Yeah. Just, like, looking for the bathroom. Like, hey, hello, does anybody know where the ladies' room is? I can't find it. Also, I got to get back before sundown. Trash is my worry. Yeah. <laughs> the more she's treated like a guest, the less she feels like a prisoner. <laughs> that's their logic and this, I lose it again I write but you know what fuck it let's go talk to Fred Williamson for no goddamn reason and also go through every goddamn gang to get this girl because who the fuck 
cares? So we go back to the tiger base. Trash convinces Fred to work with him, right? So yeah, Fred Winston's like, oh yeah, I'll get your girlfriend. Uh, let's go walk 10 feet over to that other base where she is because right. uh, obviously it's very close. We don't even need to get in one of those pimp cars. We can just literally walk through this tunnel yeah. and get there. Yeah, These tunnels connect every land. <laughs> Within feet, you can get to the other gangs. Literally, just like Disney World, underneath. <laughs> Let's go get that girl that's not even tied up at this point or anything. She's just walking by open windows. Let's go see if we can see her. Yeah. So then we go into that. Okay, so we go into the scavenger base, and there's just a fight scene, right? And they find that one guy who is going to go tell Trash. And I only mention this because, man, is he fucking bloodied up. Mm-hmm. This guy's oh, got his... His wrist is... Okay, his hand is literally hanging from his wrist by, like, tendons. You can yeah, see bone. Yeah, it's, like, snapped off. It is it's glorious. <laughs> okay, one thing that this film does right is the Italians know how to do gore. Yeah, really well. for sure. And this is and amazingly executed. Long death scenes. Yeah. So this guy, <laughs> this guy, we get, like, a three-minute scene after all this fighting. So they get in this big... No, we don't even get the fight yet, right? Yeah. We we walk in and we see this guy chained up. Yeah, mm-hmm. and you're saying like amazing gore effects. Yeah. And Trash walks up to him with like a tear rolling down his face. And they have like he he holds this man's head next to his head yeah. and hugs him like this is the fucking end of Hamlet or something. Mm-hmm. And he's like, Good night, sweet prince, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he's fucking holding him and they're crying together and he's like, It hurts so bad, Trash, it hurts so bad. But I love you so much and he's like, I love you too and then he just snaps the guy's neck, yeah. you know? They talk in poetry for like three minutes yeah he snaps his neck and then closes his eyes nicely with his hand yeah. tears stream down the face then the scavengers attack they get in a big fight the whip girls whipping people fred williamson's killing guys all hell is breaking loose yeah there is a like trash is like confronted at one point and fred williamson cuts a dude's head off yeah which that is was awesome. amazing yeah it's a good head cut when the best i've seen and because, it was really like, it unexpected was cut together really crazy yeah like it looked very good yeah so then that's it yeah. After the head cut, we're done. We go to the zombie base, and then Ice is basically still there being like, hey, can I have that girl? And he's like, well, we need her for the 8 o'clock show. But <laughs> after that, I mean, it's fine. I guess we don't yeah. really need her. Uh, She's on call. <laughs> <laughs> and then Hot Dog is spying from the, for like spying on this for no reason. Yeah. No reason at all. Mm-mm. Remember when Vic Morrow said he'd be back in 15 minutes? No. We cut back to the office, and Vic Morrow is for some reason in Manhattan now. We don't it know how he got no there. Sense. Yeah. He's, he's like, hey, hot dog, I'll be back in 15 minutes. And when I mean be back, I mean I'll be back in Manhattan. Yeah. Somehow I teleported over <laughs> the, bridge the bridge in 15 <laughs> fucking minutes to this office. And Vic Morrow's sitting in this office, and the guys walk in, and they're like, hey, Hammer, wait, why are you here? Yeah, exactly. Where's the girl? And he's like, oh, yeah. And then he basically, call, like, hot dog calls him on a phone. A phone! And says, like, oh, hey, I found the girl. And I write, wait, Vic Morrow needed to go all the way back to the base instead of just go with Hot Dog to where the girl is? Yeah. He literally had to go back to the base? Was it formality? None of this makes any sense. I, I wrote, why wouldn't he just go get the fucking girl? Yeah. But is he calling for backup, though, right? I mean, why would, if he can call well, him. Call, why, yeah. If there's fucking yeah. phones, call for backup. Yeah, call for backup like that. Not go there. <laughs> That basically, Morrow's like, all right, well, I'll find the girl. And the office guys walk away, and I just write, okay, yeah. well, that's that. We go to the zombie base, and finally, Fred, Trash, and the Whip Lady arrive at the fucking place they should have walked to in the first 20 yep. minutes of this goddamn mm-hmm. movie. Now the girl is tied up, but like I said, I'm not sure she's tied up. This might just be some sort of routine or practice mm-hmm. for the show coming yeah. up because she doesn't look like she's actually tied up with these no. chains. It looks like she's wrapped them around her wrist <laughs> loosely. <laughs> she's holding them. And she's, like, going to do a pull-up with them or something. Yeah, like our Cirque du Soleil kind of thing. Yeah, these are like the rings in the Olympics or something. She's going to do a little twirl at some point during the show. Basically, Fred confronts that zombie boss, and they fight. Fred wins by shoving his head through a window and stabbing him in the back. And then Trash and the girl uh, fight some guys with Fred. And then Hot Dog shows up, and basically he's like, Hey, Ice, can you go get that girl for me? And Ice tries to shoot him with this gun that Mm. Morrow gave him. And, of course, it's filled with blanks because it's a fucking movie. And every goddamn gun's filled with blanks for no goddamn fucking reason. (sighs) But then it's great because Ice has that part where he switches. He gets a switchblade out of his boot and knifes Hot Dog in the stomach. Yeah, that's beautiful. Curtains on Hot Dog. Yeah, that's a wrap. Thank you. Uh, we oh. called him hot dog because that's what he liked to eat on set. You mm. know? <laughs> it would have been great if we had the, like a high kick throat slash with it, though. <laughs> yeah, that would have been great. Or like through the chin, like uh, Punisher style. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
So trash. Okay, basically, then it goes to like trash, and the girl just kind of wander around the building, and trash looks like an idiot, like he always fucking does. Like mm-hmm. he's he's just his mouth is agape, and he's confused, and he's like, oh, geography. There's nothing worse <laughs> to me. I don't know where I am. Even though this place has a map that they hand out for every tour, I still have yet to get one. <laughs> and he says like he calls out for ice to come out, and at this point, I don't know if he's calling for ice to come out because he's mad at him or just because he's lost, and he's like, hey, wait, ice, are <laughs> yeah. you around? Where am I? Yeah. And then Ice comes out, and he blames everything on the woman. <laughs> it's like a crown film. And then he gives some speech. They fight. It doesn't last long. Trash kicks him down a big hole, and it's like the fatality of the Mortal Spike Kombat. Pit. Yeah. yeah, I thought Mortal Kombat when I saw this. It's definitely like you uppercut oh, the guy beautiful. down the spike pit in Mortal Kombat. He yeah. falls on a spike like a punji stick or whatever it is. Yeah. and goes right through his fucking chest. Yeah. Done. Phenomenal. Go back to the tiger base. This, oh my God, here we go. We cut to a shot of all the tigers and the tra- and trash listening to the girl playing the piano. Like she's giving him a concerto mm-hmm. now. And then the Manhattan Project people we see like flying over the city and they're mm-hmm. like, commence burnt earth, operation oh burnt earth. Which is basically a helicopter flying around and some guys running out of trucks, which we'll never see, by the way. No. But instead, we will get men with flamethrowers attached to their backs riding on horses with leather armor. Yeah. Ugh. Like some weird uh, World War One fantasy Ugh. video game. Like even the Manhattan Corporation has their own gang. Yeah. That they've choreographed very well. Oh. The amount of leather bought for this movie. I, I mean, the amount of cows that were killed to make this movie... <laughs> <laughs> vegan friendly it, it is probably not probably fed the country of Italy for a week <laughs> <laughs> do you know how many <laughs> shoes they could have made in Italy with this cow so Hammer leaves the control room finally right yeah. and the office guy says he wants no witnesses left behind and now Vic Morrow's put on his black outfit mm-hmm. he's now joined his gang we go back to the tiger base here we go Chris this this is so fucking good so we get those horse flamethrower guys right up mm-hmm. but at the same time Chris it's a special day yeah Okay. Somebody's got a birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so Fred Williamson says, like, Trash, I got a surprise for you. And he says it all ominous, right? Yeah, yeah. And he like pulls out his knife, his little <laughs> his little birthday. needle stick sword, yeah. right? Yeah. And he's like, Trash, I got a surprise for you. And then he's like, one, two, three. And then these people walk out, Chris, <laughs> and explain to me. Okay. What are they holding? This this is the most it is the size of like a like a pool table. Like is it's this, like it bigger than this table that's in yeah, front of us. Yeah, it is this confection that is towering. It is like the skyline of New York of Manhattan. It is, it is the skyline yeah. of Manhattan. Yeah, like as a yeah. cake. Yeah, but like detailed, it's very detailed. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently they have the ability to not only bake a cake, but to bake a large cake. Yeah. Like, <laughs> all right, this cake would take like a week. Yeah. Like, do you think Fred said, hey, this is a, I'm going to go help Trash, but when we come back, can you get that cake ready? Mm. It's her birthday. And the candles. I just found out it's, it's, it's Trash's new girlfriend's birthday <laughs> today. <laughs> can you make us a cake of the skyline of New York City? <laughs> And I want it to be six feet long. <laughs> it takes like three people to carry this fucking cake out. <laughs> I would have liked it more if they if they uh, had it on the hood of the car and drove it out. Like one of the nice cars. This thing is huge. Yeah. Huge, this thing. Like you said, it's the size of a fucking pool table. Mm. And they carry it out and they're like, ah, da, da, happy birthday <laughs> to the girl. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> Why did we need this in the movie? <laughs> Why? This is like in Switchblade Sisters where they made a cake, but take it to the extreme. Oh, yeah. The fucking skyline of a cake is a 3D cake they've made. <laughs> like The skyline, and we're not kidding, it has the Empire State Building on the cake, yeah. and it's like all like little pieces of cake. We have like every floor of every building etched in at the size of these things. I mean, this thing this thing would be like something you would see at like a, a fancy gathering. <laughs> Like, like Trump himself would order this at Trump <laughs> Tower for his birthday. I mean, this is like a thousand dollar cake. This, this is thing. like this, this is like Baron's birthday party cake. You know? <laughs> I mean, I hope they got a picture of this thing before they fucking cut it, right? But no, the fucking people have to ruin their party. Yeah. The horse guys show up and they just start burning everything. Yeah. And everybody's catching on fire. <laughs> and there's like a big fight that happened. Okay. This is what I would have loved is we get a close-up of the cake and everyone's cheering and you see this large, like, 
burst of flames go over the candles, <laughs> pan back like it's a guy on horseback with a flamethrower. <laughs> like, torture the shit out of it. We never see the cake again, which I was sad. They could have yeah. had like, some guy fall through it or yeah. like, burned or something. Yeah. No, they it's had to give race. it back. Yeah. Like I said, it was it was a do-over at Trump Tower. Yeah. <laughs> Do. <laughs> Uh, so basically, Vic Morrow takes his position because he will not move <gasps> oh during this fight, right? Yeah. So Vic Morrow stands in front of a big hole <laughs> yeah. where he can look down, and then he just begins his laugh. <laughs> this maniacal laughter. So, <laughs> he just looks up and he goes, <laughs> <laughs> he'll do that for five minutes straight. Yeah, yeah. It will just be played voiceover throughout the rest of this fight scene. Mm. So Vic Morrow takes his position. The fight scene happens. Fred Williamson is killed. The gr- the lady with the whip is killed. Everybody is killed, including the girl. Yeah. And at this point, the girl is killed. <laughs> the only thing Morrow had to do was go get that girl. Yeah. They're paying him a million dollars to bring back this girl, and she's fucking killed by flamethrower or whatever <laughs> this is. Or somebody shoots her or some shit. Yeah. Like, nobody had a picture of her and said, like, well, don't kill this girl. Everybody else is killed, but not this girl. No. She's dead. Yeah, he's just guessing at this point. She dies in Trash's arms, right? (laughs) Right. So this mission is a failure. A complete fucking (laughs) failure. And so Vic Morrow's just sitting there laughing. This is like in any, like, Grand Theft Auto mission where, like, you just don't get something right. You just, like, well, fuck it. You just start blowing up cars (laughs) left and right. Like, killing people. Like, running people over. (laughs) Yeah. So Vic Morrow just never stops laughing. Yeah. And then Trash picks up a big harpoon gun and li- points it right at Vic Morrow and it, Vic Morrow just watches him do it yeah. and then he shoots it at him this harpoon right shoots Vic Morrow yeah. right through the chest with this thing yeah. trash ties it to his motorcycle just drives out of the building and is pulling Morrow's corpse behind him freeze frame credits yep i could tell it was going to be a freeze frame credits there was just something about the way the shot was set up it was very it was majestic yeah it was wide it was everything was coming out of this castle that yeah williamson lives in and i'm like let me guess this is the last scene and it was because it was that beautiful it was that perfect (laughs) credits roll music plays yeah recommendation i'm you know i'm gonna say yeah it, this is not to be missed i say a hundred percent this yeah. is one of the craziest fucking movies ever made it's insanity yeah i mean yes there are there are pacing problems yeah. there oh, are definitely. plenty of pacing that is problems. what definitely turned me off was the pacing but the content of this movie is so baffling it's like a man wanted to make a musical. He just wanted to make a West Side Story, but somebody said, all right, well, you can do whatever you want with the movie. You can do, dress these guys up in whatever costumes you want. They can do dance numbers, whatever it wants, but it has to be set in the apocalypse, mm. and it has to be about them rescuing abroad. <laughs> <laughs> you fit that in. Oh, and also, you got to use Vic Morrow, because I got, I got him. He's on contract we need to fulfill this deal. So, I, I look, I told him, yeah, just put him in it for like 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> also, I got this guy with a club foot I'd like to call Hot Dog. That's a friend of mine. Can you please put him in the movie? Yeah. Whatever you want to do with the story is your business, boy. Mm-hmm. Just make sure it's set in the apocalypse. Also, I got I got locations in the Bronx, but I couldn't get the streets. So, uh, fast and loose with this yeah. one. Yeah, right? no permits. <laughs> you got that, Mr. Mr. Spaghetti? <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> so yeah, I, I'd say I'd say it's a watch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't look at me like that, Chris. I know you heard that sound. Fuck that. I know you see who's oh, idling right God, next to us. Yeah. I know you see yeah. who's idling right in front of you, Chris. <laughs> Literally in front of me is a, is the straight arrow, a, a miniature of the straight arrow, and oh, and Dugan's Beagle, the van killer, is down behind it. It's now there we go. There we go. <laughs> oh come on, Chris. You know the straight arrow is not a bottom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's very true. Chris, explain what we're talking about. <laughs> if this is the first time you were listening to this program, we always harken back to the first movie we ever covered, 1977's The Van. No longer episode one, but now episode 47? And, and you listen, one. And one. A movie about a ginger little shit that gets a big garish yellow van that he earns with uh, his ra- his money from his car wash job and uses it to lure w- women into it with the intentions of having his sexual way with him. 
Also, he's a rapist. He's a serial rapist. Yeah. <laughs> he's, 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 uh, let's not get in. This and line. he has now started a crepe business out of the van called Serial Crepist. Yeah. Let's not beat around the bush here. He's a, he's a rapist piece of shit. And uh, his friend... But we're supposed to root for him. Yeah. Somehow. And his friend Andy, a.k.a. Danny DeVito, what kind of scenarios and hijinks these two get into? I think they get word of this girl... Well, this certainly is the future. It's now 1990. Right. We know this movie does take place in 1990. Mm -hmm. So eight years from 1982 when this movie was made, Mm -hmm. the Bronx was going to get even worse and be overrun by show tune gangs. Yeah. Chris, how how does Bobby and DeVito stumble on this? Oh, uh, I think they get word that there's a contract out for this woman, and they think they're going to jump on this contract, and they take the straight arrow into the Bronx (laughs) across it. He searched far and wide for this quote broad. <laughs> Bobby, I hear this is broad. She's worth a lot of money. She's the richest girl in the world, Bobby. Yeah. So if anything, well, I say this, Bobby, hands off, please. <laughs> but I did bring the claw for him, so, you yeah. know, it's it's called the forget-me-not for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I think happened. Uh, they both had varying opinions on what to do with this woman once they found her. <laughs> Bobby was wanted to be very hands-on with her. DeVito said no. And she's worth a lot of money, Bobby. Yeah. And so it ended with uh, a fight, a, a little skirmish, a, a brawl broke out in the van as they found her and started running towards her in the straight arrow. And they lost control, uh, drove it off the bridge, and died in a fiery explosion. <laughs> okay. I, I'm, I'm kind of along the lines of yours, Chris. Mm. But what I think is like the Bronx Warriors 2... I think it starts in that office, and you know, nobody knows what really happened mm-hmm. in Opera- Operation Burnt Earth, mm-hmm. okay? The people over in that Manhattan Corporation are a little bewildered. Yeah. They never heard back from Vic Morrow. No. He ran with all the money. They should have paid him half up front and half yeah. at the end. It didn't work out that way, unfortunately. Yeah. They don't know what happened to the girl. They assume she's still there. They don't know if she's dead, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, boy. So they sit in an office, and he goes like, well, the hammer was our best choice, and he goes... Well, he was the best choice, but not the only choice. Mm-hmm. And I go, who do you have in mind, sir? And you hear, And the Bronx Warriors 2 is just Bobby and DeVito going through the Bronx land in the straight arrow. Yeah. Encountering all these gangs. Yeah. And DeVito being like, Bobby, why is there all these gay people that live in the Bronx? <laughs> I mean, not that there's anything wrong with it, Bobby. I'm just saying it's very interesting They're to very me. cultured, and they're dancing there. <laughs> Bobby, we don't have this in L.A. <laughs> yes. This is an East Coast thing. It's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I enjoyed that show we, get, we, we enjoyed last night, the Mind Magician show. That was very good. I don't know where we're going to find this broad, though, Bobby. Mm-hmm. It's only men around here. <laughs> and they're very friendly, by the way. Mm-hmm. They seem to really like the inside of the van. <laughs> they insist on being on that waterbed with you. <laughs> they put the literally. We met put, a lot of good friends out here. Yeah, they literally put the chloroform over their mouth themselves. <laughs> so I think at the end of this, Bobby, uh, at one point, he kind of accidentally runs over. Like, well, Fred Williamson's dead, actually. Mm-hmm. So maybe Bobby and DeVito decide, well, they need a new king in town. Mm. And that that crown fits perfectly on top of that poof hair. Yeah. Yeah. And so Bobby becomes the new king of the Bronx. <laughs> and every any, any quote, broad, that comes mm. over that bridge, mm. well, she's Bobby's girlfriend yeah. first. Because <laughs> you know the Bronx rules, Chris. Yeah. You see her first, she's your girlfriend. <laughs> 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 like, what, like kindergarten schoolyard rules? <laughs> well, that, that's the movie. That's the what Bronx, yeah. That's yeah, them the Bronx. <laughs> them, them's the Bronx. <laughs> Maybe them's the Bronx. <laughs> so eventually it all ends with DeVito and Bobby getting into a lot of scuffles because yeah. Bobby won't give up the current girlfriend mm. and DeVito's like I want a piece and he's like DeVito you're the court jester <laughs> <laughs> you get the you get the girl when I'm done with her eat this can of peaches but Bobby they always end up dead <laughs> I can't I can't help it I love too hard <laughs> oh Jesus there's Christ. a lot of girls who've impaled themselves in that pit <laughs> Chris they didn't get pushed <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> There's every time a woman comes over that bridge, she's Bobby's for a night, yeah. and then she's into the pit. Yeah, and th- not a body in sight that pushed her. No. She just hopped right in. Yeah, <laughs> that Mortal Kombat pit is just filled. <laughs> they uh, gave themselves a number cut, and the next thing they know, so he's like, "Bobby, can I have one? Can I have a turn?" <laughs> no. I can see Devito trying to climb down into that pit, trying to get like some kind of you know. <laughs> Of course he did. Remnants. Chris. Of course he did. <laughs> Actually, what DeVito did was try to build a woman out of the parts from the pit. <laughs> and Chris, uh-oh, it was Sheetar, Sheetar. from Blood Diner. <laughs> yep, I knew it. I was waiting for that. <laughs> and then Sheetar becomes the new queen of the Bronx. Ah. And dims the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for joining us on another episode of The Grind Bin. Mm-hmm. If you want to get in touch with us, grindbin at gmail.com, grindhousefilm.com, Twitter, at GrindPod. Mm-hmm. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. Wherever uh, social media sites are found. And guess what? If what? you rate and review this show on iTunes or any other uh, platform, by the way. I saw yeah. somebody give us a review on Stitcher. Thank uh-huh. you very much. And by the way, fuck you, Stitcher, for putting ads in shows that you don't fucking own. Oh, yeah. They put ads in shows. Fuck that. If any of you listen to this show on Stitcher, tell me if there's ads in your shows because we obviously aren't getting any fucking money from that. No. They also degrade the quality of the audio. Oh, yeah. Yeah, which is a bunch of fucking bullshit. It's like, like, you might as you well want... listen... It's like ham radio yeah. when, when it gets to you. But if you want to give us a review on there, thanks. Yeah, other than that, <laughs> fuck you, Stitcher. Any... Go fucking suck. <laughs> Anywhere you give us a review, Google Play, iTunes, whatever it might be, send us proof, tell us you did it, and you can have a request that we will do blind watch on this show. Oh, yes. Just like Bobby did for this episode. Mm-hmm. And we love it all the same. And if you'd be so kind as to click that purple rectangular subscribe button, and if it's in Google Play, hit that as well. We will be ever so grateful. You will never miss another bin. And I would just like to say, Chris. Yeah. There was somebody that liked a tweet today of ours. Oh, yeah. And his location? Yeah. France. No. Well, he didn't email us, though. Nope, but... So, so fuck him. I saw a French listener on Twitter. Oh, my God. And now I'm going to Twitter stalk your fucking ass. <laughs> it's like seeing Sasquatch in the wild, you know? <laughs> I was like, who's this guy? I never... What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I found a late binner. Oh, Lebin! Bobby, start that Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>